Please go ahead, Harko. Thank you, Niraf. Uh, yes, design heuristics for ethical online institutions by the Fab Four, I would say. That's Pablo, me, Julian, and Mark. The agenda for today, uh, we start with the challenge that we try to meet. Uh, we sketch some steps of a solution to that challenge. Uh, we try to give a practical example, and then we describe also the current state of our work and some next steps. Uh, I will try to be not too detailed because the details are in the paper, but we will see how good we can manage with that. So what is the challenge that we try to meet? Well, it's a, it's a very broad challenge. So if AI is everywhere, as we sometimes think, or at least see, then we can think, okay, how can we make it sure that it really works for the benefit of humankind, to use some big words? Well, from our perspective, uh, we can see two uh, broad approaches. Uh, the first one would be to design these systems according to certain values, principles, or ethics, and give them mechanisms of evaluation to ensure that the system as such is working for the benefit of humankind. Uh, one example of that type of research is the AI for People work by Floridi et al. Uh, and the other one uh, approach that we see is the one that we uh, ourselves uh, support, which is to focus on the design of uh, hybrid online systems where AI and human agents interact and make sure that the interactions are aligned with certain values and ethical principles. So we will focus on the second part. The steps of a solution to such a challenge. Uh, we base, of course, our work on previous work, both by ourselves and others. Um, and they fall into different categories. So from the social sciences, institutions, not that straight in coin, uh, some management theory, which is uh, relatively new in uh, this paper and in the previous paper that we published earlier this year. The work on norms, uh, we have been working on that for a long time, of course. Norms is in the name of COIN as well, so we're not the only ones working on that. And for values, we turn to Rokic and Swartz. From computer science, we try to base uh, the ideas that we have on the value sensitive design. For example, Friedman works on that in the HCI. And relatively new to our list of favorites there is the design patterns, uh, where Alexander, who unfortunately not so long ago passed away, is uh, the main author to look at. And then, of course, from the AI agent research, the two of the pillars uh, that were mentioned in uh, the opening by Tony from COIN is the institutions and the norms, and of course, the ethics is there as well. But that's not really a pillar that we built upon, it's more something that we try to produce. As I said, we don't only were build our work on other people's work, but also on our own work. Um, if we have the two pillars that we will talk about a little bit, uh, but very much in detail in the paper and in other papers, the WIT um, principles, they were already presented in 2013, 2014, and in 2014 in two corn papers. And the consensus design idea was also already in 2014, but even in 2016 in COIN. So you can say that we are regulars and we keep on bothering you with our ideas and hope to get wiser along the way. To recap, uh, the previous work, WIT, uh, where WIT stands for World Institutions and Technology, and it describes the, our idea of what online institutions are. Uh, they are open, regulated online multi-agent systems. Uh, there's an interaction space, and that is what we call the world. The institutions, uh, they observe and regulate the agent actions, and technology is the mediator of the interaction. What we have added uh, recently is the idea of seeing this as a design pattern, uh, and we also claim that these open institutions are situated, which is the right-hand side of the picture that you can see on the slide. And the left-hand side is a uh, more fleshy version of the already available picture we had in 2013, 2014. Uh, regarding consensus design, uh, we have previously described this as three values, and now we call them value categories. So that's a slight change of heart but they are still the same uh, as such. So thoroughness, mindfulness, and responsibility are the pillars on which we feel that this design reproach should be based. 
So now the real challenge is how to design such a wet CD system. Um, we have talked earlier about stakeholders, but in this paper, we're much clearer about what we mean with stakeholders. So in our take, uh, we see four different categories of stakeholders. There's someone who owns or orders the system. There's someone who develops the system, and that could be more people. And uh, we call that in our paper, an engineer. We've had long discussions about what to call it, but engineers where we ended up. We have users that are uh, in direct contact with the system. And then we have indirect stakeholders that are affected by the system, but not really involved in affecting the development of the system, whereas users usually are. What we did say previously is that these goals and values of these stakeholders should be taken into account. What we now specify in the paper is what we mean with this. So we say values, they need operationalization, contextualization, assessment, and then combined alignment to best satisfy all the stakeholders. And the satisfying is, of course, the idea from Herb Simon that we don't optimize, but we satisfy. Now, how can you do this? That is the list of heuristics that we present in the paper all the steps that we feel are necessary to take into account, to understand and to follow. So the first uh, heuristic is that we need to see this as an iterative process. It's not one time input and then we're done, we design a system and all Bob is your uncle and we're all good. Um, we also say that co-design, which means a st strong uh, cooperation between the different stakeholders, uh, including the engineer, uh, that has to be carried out in an ethical way. For this, you need to have value assessment of all the stakeholders. Now, what values are at stake? That really depends, of course, on the, day, on, on the domain, uh, on the stakeholder, but also on the context in which the uh, resulting system is to be used. Further on, if you fork Rokic, you can say that these values can be structured in kind of value hierarchy, uh, which means that we can structure the search space a bit. We use value interpretation uh, from the context to see what the meaning of the value is. And then that is the basis for how we can assess the values. Then we need to represent these values into the machine. Uh, that, so we take these interpretations and make it into an abstract representation for the open institution. Furthermore, the measurement that we then can do, uh, that has to focus on how the stakeholder satisfying is working out in the individual level before we turn to the system level. And of course, since this is uh, also an iterative uh, process, this value alignment also needs to go back and forth until there is a satisfactory system level solution. From our perspective, these sets of heuristics all together can support the development of the system. Now, all of this sounds quite abstract. So let's see if we have an example. So we designed an example, which is quite simple. It's an online, ticketing service for a railway company. If we turn to the direct stakeholders, uh, we ignore the indirect stakeholders for the time being for simplicity reasons. The owner would be the railway company. They would have as a goal to fill the trains. We have users, which are passengers and that are humans. They buy and sell back tickets and their idea is to get a ticket. We have travel agents and they are the software or AI agents. They want to make profit on the selling of the tickets to the passengers and buying of the tickets from the owner. And we of course have the engineer, which is the co-design implement and maintain role. And as an engineer, there's only one goal, build a great system. Now we have to translate that again. So we take these categories we start with the engineer as an example. And the engineer's ultimate goal is to build and design a proficient AOS OI system. 
given the three value categories that I described in the start, we have to think in terms of thoroughness, mindfulness, and the responsibility. For each of these value categories, we can describe certain values that fit there. And then we can also contextualize the system to make sure that there is some kind of relationship between the institution, the technology, and the world. We also take into account that this OI needs to be in isolated, should be integer, and there's a technical compatibility that we need if it's situated in an environment otherwise. Now, this doesn't look too complicated, but we can make things more complicated. We can take the values from Rokic and Swartz and try to see how can we put these values into play here. That's quite a list, but we're not done yet. This is for the three stakeholders. And we can get one more step to follow the final part of the heuristics in which we have, we have ends, we have means, we have a measurement of the values, and we have a satisfaction value. That sounds as if I'm almost done. So I have two minutes left. Thank you so much for the clear sound system. I'm turning a little bit deaf here. That was all I wanted to talk about today. So we have our process with the heuristics and we show you how we can apply those systems in an example. The heuristics, you can read the details in the paper. But the real deal is yet to come. So. What we now want to do is turn this conceptual framework into a practical testing situation of a real system rather than a simple example system. We look forward to uh, discussing this and working together with policymakers and to develop practices for co-design, which are more or less lacking in the AI uh, environments. So with these words, I'm open for questions. Thanks a lot, Harko. I've disabled the, the chat because uh, we, we experienced Zoom bombing in another workshop. So, uh, but I, I uh, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, so if you have any questions, please use the raise hand. I, uh... I will stop my share so yeah. I can see everything even better. Please use the raise hand icon or the emoji to, or feel free to just unmute and ask your question. I, I see Frank uh, yeah. has a question. Okay, um, that would be very awkward if I didn't ask a question maybe. Um, so you you gave this example, which uh, I thought was uh, pretty neat. So in the end, to see exactly uh, how it gets operationalized. Did you uh, do that uh, together, or did one of you do that and made a proposal and talked with the other ones on whether it was suitable? Or so uh, in in our thinking process, we discuss a lot. So we have weekly meetings uh, when we work on our papers. Mm -hmm. um, and we interact in different ways. So this is um, an example that uh, first was thought out by Pablo, then it was worked out together with Pablo and Mike, then Julian and I had to take on it, gave it back to Pablo and uh, on and on it went. So our writing process and our thinking process is very much an iterative process as well. So the content of the paper has been going back and forth between the four of us several times. So the, the main underlying question is uh, uh, getting from values to an operationalized uh, uh, thing. Uh, that is usually where a lot of discussion can happen. And then when you do this kind of co-design, uh, the question is always who has, uh, who has more status, who has more power, and who actually determines the outcome. Uh, yeah. And what could you do to get every stakeholder being uh, represented properly? and also getting satisfied with the result. Yeah, that is, that is definitely uh, the biggest challenge. And of course, uh, we in this simple uh, example, we have full control over the search space, right? So we design mm -hmm. it ourselves and say everyone is in agreement. Uh, once you get to very large groups of stakeholders, things become very, very problematic and, and difficult, of course. 
Uh, however, in our idea that the um, the satisfying function makes life a little bit easier, so we don't have to work for an optimal solution. Uh, but of course, that only helps so far. So in, in a complicated situation where the interest and values of the different stakeholders would be diametrically against each other, then for sure, it would be a difficult situation. Um, my idea then would be that we need to ask ourselves, is this uh, system actually uh, to be put to use? Mm -hmm. if, it does, if it doesn't help all the stakeholders, if it doesn't work for the good of humankind mm -hmm. in, in the big picture, then maybe we shouldn't do it. Yeah, so in the in the context of uh, simulations, I, I'm now considering to be able to have a kind of quick dry run for everyone to see the consequences. If we take this kind of interpretation, this would be the consequence for the system. This would be the kind of things that come out just to give, give everyone the same basis. And um, I find that there is no uh, support tools to do anything like that. And I think that would be very interesting if, uh, uh, so I like the approach. And this is the kind of things I think we would really need to do and would be very useful to actually make this practical as well. Yeah, earlier today, I, uh, I had a seminar here at my local department with a colleague of yours, uh, Karen Danielson, who's an expert in these type of uh, co-design uh, processes. And this is the exact thing we talk about. Co-design is uh, more sustainable, but difficult to do, but you have to do it good. And you have to look at these consequences before you start implementing things for real. So yes, these, uh, let's say a sharp, relatively sharp version to see consequences of choices. That's definitely the real way to go forward. Okay. I saw Michael had, had, had a hand up. Uh, Michael, if your question is quick, maybe you can. Um, yes, I, I just was not sure if I should further delay the process. Um, thank you for your talk. I would like to know uh, what formal languages uh, do you have in mind to formalize values and like weighing values against each other? Yeah, so um, I'm sure that in the group of authors, there would be at least one person who says, well, I have an idea of some formal systems mm -hmm. or, or uh, languages. From my perspective, I'm thinking of any computer as a Turing machine, so I can use each and every system to specify. Okay. Some will be better than others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think Fra Frank has... I just <laughs> raised my hand to point out who the author is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so th there are there are quite some thing, different things uh, available as well, but there, there are some formal stuff on values and connecting that with actions and all. So. Okay. Okay. So okay. with this, can, can we thank our speaker again and and thank you all. Thank you, Harko. Uh, let us go to our second presentation. It is. Social motives and social contracts in cooperative survival games. I think uh, Matt Scott is the presenter. It, uh, the paper is with Matt Scott, Matthew, David, and Jeremy Pitt. Matt. Hey, how's it going? Uh, let me just share my screen quickly. Yeah. Uh, this should be working now. It's okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Uh, sorry, I guess the time starts now, huh? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, so, well, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, the point of this uh, kind of um, discussion was to, I guess, make more clear, kind of formalize this idea of resource management. And I suppose the, the kind of connection that it has to an idea of cooperative survival. So I suppose, you know, whether it be a kind of socio-technical system, whether it be a cyber-physical system, there's no doubt that this, um, <clears throat> you know, the idea of sharing a kind of communal resource, the idea of you know, as just giving an example, you know, let's say you have like a shared kind of sharing power with like a communal battery or whatnot. The kind of formalization of norms and institutions is a decent way of um, kind of maintaining a shared resource. And we'd like to think that you could incentivize this by kind of introducing this idea of like death to the agents. So having an idea of corporate survival where if your kind of personal pool runs low, then um, that would obviously incentivize you to kind of take more from the communal pool. And given that level kind of given that like framework i'd love to think that in the future given the kind of you know the advent of more technology and whatnot i, I think it's it's a kind of fair statement to say that we're going to see a, a lot of application of that in the future 
And, you know, without a doubt, the use of kind of multi-agent systems with agent-based modeling is a decent way of simulating, uh, I guess, you know, real world scenarios and I guess being able to formalize them in some kind of functional language. So the specifics of the uh, kind of the, the example that we've gone for is actually based on a movie. So, you know, as, a, as all good engineers should, you know, I think it's impossible to watch a film these days without thinking, you know, maybe it'd be nice to see if we could formalize this in a kind of academic way. So I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the, the film, the platform, but you know, I'll describe more or less how, how exactly how it works. Uh, it's a Spanish film by Golda. I can't pronounce the surname, so forgive me on that one. But um, the, the kind of general concept is you have this idea of, uh, you know, a, a platform in this like kind of tower of like a hundred or so um, like prisoners. And at the start of each day, you'll have some food on the platform, as you can see. And as it kind of iteratively passes through, through the tower, agents will, or the, the, the players, or the prisoners will take the food and it'll kind of continue through propagating through until the platform is empty by which point it'll be you know reset the top of the platform for the next day uh these days will continue to to you know go through it's an iterative process and <clears throat> when sorry yeah when uh kind of the, so the, the players have kind of consistently had low kind of low food intake naturally it's going to be affecting their health so once uh, a player were to die due to not receiving any food um, they'll be kind of replaced with a new prisoner for the process to start again, and they'd be replaced with full health. So one way that we wanted to kind of approach the the idea of having kind of players in the game was not so much just to have everyone play in the exact same way. We wanted to introduce this idea of social motives, so connected to more of a kind of real world scenario, as you know, in the spirit of you know, agent based modeling should be it should attempt to at least uh, reflect uh, kind of life well. So we used Fulmer's principle of social motives, i.e. the psychological processes that drive people's thinking, feeling, and behavior, to abstract the uh, prisoners in the tower, to give them like a, I guess, different behaviors in a sense, different like uh, approaches to the, to the way that they take food. So we define them on like a spectrum, a dynamic spectrum that is with a kind of this concept of an altruistic agent who would, you know, take a zero food for themselves and prioritize the, you know, the well-being of the, the, the person on the floors above and below them. There would be a collectivist agent who would arguably be like less aggressive, who would favor the collectivist, uh, the favor the collective as a whole. Selfish agents would prioritize themselves uh, without compromising the downfall of the collective. And a narcissistic agent would take true like everything they could possibly want for themselves without caring really what the collective would, would, um, would care about. So on top of that, we wanted to kind of like, have the idea that most people in life are not going to be one social motive the entire time. There's going to be some kind of dynamics in there. So we'd start with some base behavior from the kind of the, the once the thread is initialized, and we say that the behavior is able to update based on the kind of the, the, the living conditions, let's say. So if you've had, you know, no food for ages, if the people above you are, you know, treating you terribly, like you're probably gonna become more selfish or more narcissistic. You're gonna start prioritizing yourself because you're gonna be losing like faith in the collective. So we define some kind of prediction based on a set of weights and a, kind of a set of functions. And we scale this update with this kind of notion of uh, stubbornness. And we say that, you know, realistically, someone's not going to change their, their kind of behavior overnight. So we want to say that it would be kind of a gradual process of repeated kind of negative actions that would cause them to, to get to this point. Uh, furthermore, we want to cap, um, cap the kind of behavioral change with a maximal behavior swing. Because if you're kind of born as an, like an altruist, realistically, you're not going to become narcissist over time. Like it's... And this is this is reflected in the literature as well. I'd advise you guys to read the paper. I think the you know the the, the specifics are all in there. And the main uh, the main effect of having different social motives was the approach and the way that they took food. So altruists would take nothing, as in they would just purely want to kind of benefit the collective without any like with complete disregard for themselves. And as you can see, you know the collectivists would stay. They would satisfy themselves. They would take just enough to stay healthy. Uh, sorry, just enough to stay alive, I should say. Uh, whereas the selfish agents would want to stay in a in a kind of healthy. Uh, scenario and the narcissist would just simply take the maximum amount possible. So in a scenario or in a, in a kind of simulator that kind of favors selfishness, whereas selfishness is the rational choice, we wanted to find some kind of solution to ensure some kind of stability, i.e. limit the number of deaths in the scenario, in the, uh, in the simulator. And a way um, that we chose to approach that was the use of treaties and the formation of social contracts. So the grammar that we ended up defining was a kind of three-part grammar. We took a request where the um, the, the players in between floors will say, look, just take less than five food. You'll give them a number of turns, so a duration on the contract. And finally, a condition that the contract would not be punishable in the sense that if an agent were to go critical, you know, they were on the verge of death, then we're not going to punish them for breaking the contract. 
Uh, to limit the kind of search space of contracts for this one, to, uh, to simplify the problem a little bit, we only went for three in total that could be kind of selectively chosen by the agents. So number one was a kind of, I guess you could say not super constrictive treaty, where if you have a huge amount of health, then maybe, you know, don't take some food for a couple of turns. Uh, second one was a little bit more um, strict in the sense that, you know, if, if you are just about doing okay, then we'd still ask you to take no food because you're going to be fine. And a particularly strict one, where if you are kind of on the verge of death, we'll say you need to still limit the amount of intake you have so as you don't uh, disrupt the collective. So if you want to look at the experimentation that we've done, we ended up with a kind of set of four groups of experiments that investigated a set of different variables. So we looked at the percentage of starting behavioral motives. We looked at the concept of stubbornness, i.e. how far the behaviors will update on each turn. And we looked furthermore at how the, uh, the kind of the maximal change you can have, uh, often giving a behavioral swing of zero, as in a fixed social motive throughout the entire tower. And, for, and finally, we kind of toggled the number of treaties that would be available in this situation. So starting with simulation A, we just wanted to look at kind of the impact of just a single social motive in the whole tower. So starting off, we had pure altruists in the system, nothing else. And as you may expect, it was you know, pretty, pretty terrible the way that the, they perform. You know, they're not going to take any food. So they're all going to die straight away, which is kind of as expected. Following that, we wanted to introduce a purely narcissistic um, like, a, like tower. And again, in a similar vein, uh, only really one or two agents are going to survive the entire scenario because, well, you know, they're going to take everything for the downfall of the collective, which is one of those weird instances where whilst you may think that being altruistic is, you know, nicer thing to do than being narcissistic, in this case, they actually performed quite similarly and you couldn't really tell bar the impact of utility. Uh, if you instead change it to some selfish agents, you can see you get a fairly similar performance to that of just a pure selfish agent uh, with a kind of slightly better performance given that there's less um, kind of food taken overall. And one of the main things we wanted to draw as well is using a purely collective agent. You can actually limit the deaths to pretty much zero because they, they really do kind of find the optimal strategy in that sense. Uh, simulation B was a similar approach. We wanted to just uh, you know, start with different distributions of agents and see how they performed. The first distribution looked at a semi-even distribution with only a small number of outliers. And this was, again, nothing too notable to say. Uh, it was a similar performance to the previous two, but we wanted to really highlight the fact when you have a kind of more significant number of collectivists, then suddenly, you know, you can really limit the deaths. And this is without the treaties we'd like to add. This is just performing as a kind of self-interested agent alone without any kind of institutional power to, to limit your behavior. Simulation C, we'd like to think of the most interesting ones. This was the idea of having multiple social motives. They're able to change, i.e. The, their swing is not uh, is unlimited. And there are lots of different treaties in play. So starting with zero treaties at all, there is pretty much total instability based on the kind of starting distributions of them. You know, it, it completely fluctuates. The, the agents will die out, be re-injected with a, a, a new type, and it just pretty much uh, just oscillates completely. And there's no real notability to it. Uh, so, and uh, uh, when we introduce some more strict treaties as in C2. So C2 introduces two treaties as opposed to well, zero. And we see that a kind of increase of stabilities is a, there's, there's a decent increase in stability. You can see that there's less of a fluctuation and by the kind of, as the kind of iterative process goes, um, it tends to more of a kind of a fixed distribution of agents. And then by introducing all three treaties that we've chosen uh, as in C3, you can see you get a real kind of solid sense of stability there. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, Minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, but yeah, by introducing all three treaties, you can see that you get pretty much complete stability where it tends to a fixed distribution of all agents at about 25% each. And the final ones was everyone's a collectivist, but you're able to change and we re-inject the collectivists. Um, with no treaties, you get a complete oscillation between selfish and collectivist agents. Uh, however, when you introduce uh, all the treaties, you can see that it tends to, again, a fixed distribution that could even support narcissistic agents and kind of avoid the downfall of the collective. And the kind of general thing that we wanted to introduce you guys was this idea of rules of ignorance, which is to say that, you know, behind this idea of available ignorance, nobody knows who they are. You know, you, you lack clues, you uh, kind of have no idea about your class, your privilege, or even your personality, to be honest. And what we thought of this example as being is kind of this idea of an iterated version of rules of ignorance, where through the development of, you know, uh, treaties, through the development of norms and institutions, what you end up with is kind of the, the, the formation of a social network. So uh, we have, you know, one guy at the start here, and as the, the rounds progress, they'll get information about the rest of the agents until kind of iteratively until as the game kind of concludes, you'll end up with a kind of decent knowledge of the rest of the people in the tower and you can kind of act accordingly.
And that was all we wanted to show to you guys. Thanks. I will uh, stop, stop, stop sharing for you now. Thank you, Matt. Uh, You're welcome. Sorry, let me just. Uh, Sorry, I don't know what's. Am I still sharing? You, you, you are still sharing. I think you can continue sharing if, if you like. Uh, if there are questions you, you want to use. Yeah, I'm just trying to stop. I, I actually can't find out how to. Oh, it's because it's gone on the other screen. Sorry about that. There we go. Back to normal. Yeah. Okay. I got two screens up and it ended up switching to the other. I'm sorry about that. Uh, thank you again. Uh, any questions for Matt? Hi, yeah, I had a question, uh, Matt. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I find it not too surprising what comes out, but actually uh, I wanted to ask this kind of outcome crucially depends on the amount of resources available. So, um, uh, and I, I found it a bit uh, interesting to see that altruistic means you don't take nothing. And um, basically if everyone gets a lot, you can take a bit. I mean, any altruistic behavior also can include that. So the, the, the kind of, uh, the choices are a bit extreme. Um, if uh, the resources, if you determine them, uh, that if everyone is a little bit selfish, then you get, everyone gets enough, then that actually should come out in the end, of course. <clears throat> but uh, what's interesting is to see if, uh, the amount of resources change. And for instance, if you have less people, you can produce less resources. And therefore, if people are very selfish and people die, the other people die, the selfish people also get less in income. So you punish yourself in that way. Uh, so in, in that sense, having these fluctuations will give you probably a completely different uh, uh, outcome. Sure. Yeah, so one of the main things we were looking at for this one is just the idea of imposing uh, an economy of scarcity the entire time. Uh, we thought that by, you know, if you had maybe like two agents in the entire tower and you start with an infinite number of resources, like for sure, it doesn't matter who you choose. You know, you can have everyone narcissistic, you can have everybody selfish, it'll be fine. Uh, the main thing we wanted to ensure was that the amount of resources at the start of each uh, of each day was enough so that everyone could be, you know, satisfied, they could stay alive, but it wouldn't be able to support everyone being healthy at one time. So that's why we we, we pretty much wanted to formulate it in such a way that you needed these social contracts to be able to support the different um, behavioral types. But I mean, exactly as you say, you know, if you do have a surplus of resources, it could arguably, you know, support as, as many, you know, as many social methods as you want. It could, it could support whatever behavioral types you'd like. But uh, yeah, the kind of general thing that we wanted to look at was what happens when you really are limited in the amount you can take each turn and any surplus taking of resources would overall uh, affect the collective negatively. Okay, any other quick question for Matt? Okay. So in the interest of time, maybe we can stop now, uh, Matt. Uh, thank you again, Matt. And, Thanks so much. And we now move on to our third presentation. Uh, it's my, it is on self-learning governments of black box multi-agent systems by Michael Ostrill. Christian Bartlett, Stefan Lutke, and Henner Stuckmit. Uh, sorry, I spelled any Eric uh, said. Uh, it's any, all right. I'm, I'm sorry for the complicated German names. <laughs> so maybe in the future, I'll work with uh, American people who have easier names. No, no, no. You need not do that. I think you should tell how tell us how exactly to say your names. In each okay, yeah. My name is Michael Oesterle, um, and I'll be presenting um, our work about self-learning governance. Yes, Thank right. you. Um, so um, we are talking about multi-agent systems in general. So you have an environment and you have agents and the joint actions of all agents influence what is happening in the environment by a transition function that is pretty standard. Um, and what has long been known in game theory in multi-agent systems in dynamic systems is that if agents just selfishly try to optimize their own actions and their own utilities, then the outcome is not always possible for, for everyone and maybe not even for those agents themselves. Um, which means that just letting agents um, optimize for themselves is not always a good way. And the other extreme, what you could do is just 
govern everything and tell the agents what they have to do and not leave them any freedom anymore, which is again, what we don't want to do because then we wouldn't have a multi-agent system anymore. So um, there are a lot of approaches to deal with this problem and uh, an approach that we are pursuing here is having a governance that tells agents what they can and cannot do at a certain time. So basically every time an agent wants to choose an action, they have to ask the governance what actions are allowed and what actions are not allowed, um, which is pretty straightforward if you have a discrete action space, because then you just get a vector of yes and no's, and then you can choose from, from the actions that are allowed. And our goal is here um, to have a governance that learns to uh, create the best possible restriction policy. So um, to learn how to restrict the agents in a way that is beneficial for the overall outcome. And of course, we need to define such an overall outcome. So we need to have a function that the governance wants to, to optimize. For example, uh, in the previous talk, uh, this could be the minimizing the number of deaths, which, which would be um, a goal that is overarching, that is not just depending on one agent, but is something that uh, society would want to have. Um, the runtime process uh, is a little bit more complicated than in a normal multi-agent system where you just have this cycle of uh, transitions and actions. Um, in this governed um, multi-agent system, which is modeled as a stochastic game, you have observations of the agents, and then we have allowed actions. So every time an agent makes an observation, it cannot uh, choose their action directly, but has to ask the governance uh, for a vector of allowed actions, and then it chooses from those allowed actions. And then uh, we have a transition function as usual, and the governance can also observe what is happening um, and then uh, optimize the restriction policy. The restriction policy is basically a function that says, if an agent makes a certain observation, what can it do or what actions are allowed? And then the governance tells those actions to the agents. So um, let me just skip this. This is pretty straightforward. Um, all the, the functions are um, just mapping different, uh, different things from the environment in order to, in the end, come up with um, actions which then trigger the next step and the, the transition. Um, in our experimental setup, um, to make it a little bit more tangible, um, we looked at a table with um, a number of agents sitting around the table and they each can choose an action, so a discrete action set, um, and put this action in front of themselves on the table. And the goal of the agents is to coordinate on one action, so to reach a common choice of action. Um, the difficulty is that not everyone can see everything. You can only see what you do yourself and what your two immediate neighbors do. Um, this means if you have 10 agents and five actions, then it's already um, very complicated because random exploration does not help um, to, to find this coordination, which is why we need a governance to help the agents. And um, the experiment was set up in a way that we say, okay, the agents can try to do that independently without a governance, which would be an ungoverned case, then we have a full um, full governed case where the governance um, knows everything and can just tell the agents what to do. And then we have our balance, um, which is our new approach where governance and agents should somehow work together in order to reach that um, coordination. And the way we set this up is that in the ungoverned case, everything is always allowed. Of course, that's that's very simple. Um, in the fully governed case, um, the agents only get a reward if they achieve full coordination. So um, the agents basically don't know what what um, other agents who are not directly next to them do, but still they only get their reward uh, if full coordination is achieved which means uh, that the agents do not have any um, other information than the governance. And in the full governed case, 
uh, sorry, in the in the governed multi-agent system, um, the the new approach, um, the agents know already when they are uh, locally coordinated, but the governance only knows when the glo global coordination has been achieved. So the agents have local knowledge about um, what what the neighbors do, and the governance only has global knowledge, but the ability to restrict actions. And what you can see in the experiments, so we have a self-learning governance uh, via reinforcement learning, and we have also self-learning agents who employ reinforcement learning to choose their actions. And you can see that uh, in the ungoverned case, um, even in moderate size scenarios, I think that was 10 agents and five actions each, um, ungoverned agents do not succeed uh, to find any, um, any notable uh, rate of success because it's just too many options for random exploration. If you have a fully governed multi-agent system, it's better. So the governance learns to just tell the agents what to do. And in the uh, governed case uh, where you have uh, different types of knowledge that can be combined to, to a synergetic behavior, um, it's a much higher success rate. Um, so the governance learns to make restrictions, but not fully restrict everything. So still leave freedom to the agents because the agents have more local knowledge than the governance does. Um, so this was a limited work to discrete action spaces because that makes it easy to just have this vector of restrictions. Uh, when you have continuous action spaces or more complex spaces, it gets a little bit more uh, involved. Also, we had strongly correlated goals. So all agents wanted the same thing and the governance also had the goal of coordinating. So the question is what happens if we have conflicting goals? Do we, can we enforce cooperation or what happens if the, the goals are too far apart? And the third thing was um, we did not theoretically examine why um, certain behaviors emerged and if there would be a convergence or not. So it was mostly experimental, which means that the next step, which we are already doing and which we have started since the submission is um, go a little bit back and look at only one step of a multi-agent system. So we have a, a fixed state and then um, we say, how can we really compute the optimal restriction that the governance should employ if it was just a normal forum game with this exact one step. And um, to make it a little bit more interesting, we extended the setting to uh, continuous action spaces and gave the governance the task to find um, an optimal restriction. Thank you. Uh, an optimal restriction um, for continuous actions at only one step. And what we want to do in the future is combine those findings. So have um, a continuous action multi-agent system which evolves over time and where the governance can then find those um, optimal restrictions, not just by uh, reinforcement learning, but also in a more analytical way that lets us understand how those optimal restrictions need to be structured. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, we have some time to make up for, so um, I'm ready for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any questions for Michael? So I, I see Virginia has a question. Hi. Hi, Michael. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I My question is mostly a bit, I'm a bit puzzled the way you talk about the governance. Governance usually is seen as a process. You treat it as being an agent and basically yeah. as being an external agent to the ones who are the, the center, the, the ones who are doing the, the taking the actions. So I, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm a bit puzzled about the way you use the concept of governance because mm -hmm. in a sense, governance could be something that the agents themselves do because it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's a way to, to inter integrate, to in interact with each other and to take into account some external constraints. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's puzzling to call it that agent the governance. It's almost as puzzling as talking about the AI or an AI. Yeah, um, so thank you for this question. Um, so, 
the basic image we have in mind is that the governance is a book of rules where you can, based on your current observation, look up what you can do and what you cannot do. So it basically tells you at every in every situation what the allowed actions are. And the role of the governance is to continuously update this rule of books in order to make it perfectly suited to the environment and the agents. So the, the job of the governance is to adapt those restrictions in a way that they get better and better. Like, uh, in, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, I, I see the point, but then again, is this uh, eternal discussion that we have had in uh, in coin since coin exists uh, about the, the idea is uh, are, are norms some kind of top down trying trying to uh, to maintain some type of desired behavior for the system or our norms or the, the set of rules, something which is evolving and adapting to what the environment or the agents are changing. And yeah. it, it seems that you take it as being an a, a evolving, evolving uh, 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 thing, entity, whatever you want to call it, uh, which will adapt to the the behavior of the agents. And if the behavior exactly. of the agents is not aligned with what would be desirable uh, externally or so, society, societally, then you are changing the rules of the game to to adapt to the whims of the the, the agents. Exactly. Is so that what uh, you the want? governance the governance has a goals which would be some sort of social welfare but if it turns out that the current restrictions do not make the agents achieve this social welfare goal then the rules would be changed in order to make them better suited to what the agents do so it's always the interplay of how do agents react to the to the current rule set and how do those actions uh, pay into achieving the social welfare, and it would it is an evolving process, but the the governance goal would be given top down. So this would not be um, depending on what agents want. Okay, I, I, I had very much the feeling that this was implementing the the prime minister of the Netherlands, which during Corona would say things like, "These are the best uh, best uh, policies that we can think of, but if you don't like them, we will come up with other policies." So it seems a bit okay. that your governance is uh, implementing Mark Root, which I don't really know is the most uh, example, best example of a, gover a governing entity. That's an interesting thought. I will certainly think about how this interaction works. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, maybe we can go to the next talk. Our next talk is Embracing Awkward Real-Time Adjustment of Reactive Planning Using Social Norms this by Leila Maitnani, Andreas uh, Antoniades, and Andreas Theodoro. I think Leila yeah. is presenting. Um, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, Over great. Uh, thank you. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. My name is Leila Mithani. I'm a student at Umeå University in Northern Sweden, and I am uh, happy to be here uh, to present work done together with Andreas, Dr. Andreas Antoniadis and Dr. Andreas Diodoru. Um, our paper entitled Embracing Awkward Real-Time Adjustments of Reactive Plans Using Social Norms presents a hybrid cognitive architecture for the development of socially aware agents in multi-agent settings. Um, I'd like to step through um, what I'll talk about today, which is presenting the hybrid architecture and then um, going into a toy example that we've implemented in the popular video game Dota 2. Um, and then some in-game uh, experiments that we ran and um, present some results that we got there and then some ongoing extensions of our research. So our uh, motivation for this work is um, over a long term uh, and uh, is twofold. So um, in multi-agent settings, each member is an autonomous agent that is expected to cooperate and collaborate with its peers, which um, sometimes may involve the need to um, adjust 
its behavior in a way that deviates them from their individual um, selfish goals towards the collective um, organizational uh, goal. And often also during these interactions um, of agents with each other and their environments, um, the behavior that emerges may also seem obscure to the outside observer. Um, uh, as well as the uh, system developer themselves. And with that in mind, we um, asked, can we achieve real-time adjustment of reactive plans with the added benefit of transparency into these social interactions between agents? And notice that I specify in particular reactive planning. And um, I will hope I hope my presentation will motivate uh, a little bit why we chose to go with reactive planning agents. So um, to achieve this real-time adjustment of reactive plans, we turned or we looked to two um, promising uh, AI uh, methods, uh, namely symbolic-based AI uh, and behavior-based AI methods. Um, so we look towards symbolic AI approaches for the advantages of modeling and um, more specifically validating behaviors of the individual agent um, within an organizational setting. So more specifically, we choose um, Professor Dignam's Opera framework for the development of multi-agent systems, um, for the design and development of multi-agent systems. And we choose Opera in particular because of the offering of um, interaction uh, the interaction model and defining and specifying interaction contracts between agents. Um, so this offers us uh, transparency into interaction behavior. Um, what more is that uh, this validation through the interaction contracts between agents gives us a lever of control to adjust uh, reactive plans um, in real time. And the opera model uh, does not need any uh, specification or any knowledge of the internal architecture of the agent itself. So we chose to develop our agents in using reactive planning. So for the individual agent, we look specifically towards behavior-based methods for its um, ability to handle uncertainty and dynamic environments um, fairly well. So more specifically, we choose to use uh, Bryson's behavior-oriented design cognitive architecture for the um, modularity and the uh, agile methodology that comes with it. And again, this modularity and agile, uh, agility or agile methodology um, gives us transparency, uh, not only in the development of the agent, but also through its um, execution in the modular design. Um, what's more is BOD has been used in um, embodied agents, both in robotics and uh, games uh, in the past. So it's also um, a reason for our choice of, of uh, architecture. And so what we came up with as a hybrid architecture is uh, titled Agents with Knowledge About Real-Time Duties, or Awkward for short. And um, essentially, it is a three-modular uh, architecture. Um, it consists of the behavior library here at the uh, at the base that contains primitive um, objects that I will expand on uh, shortly, senses and actions, and connects to the planner module here in the middle in blue, and the overlaying opera social behavior module that governs um, agent behaviors on top. And um, this architecture is also inspired by uh, the du Kahneman's dual theory, um, where the opera module corresponds to the slow system two, it steps through logically, uh, or using logic uh, steps through uh, certain specif uh, specifications of interaction scenes and continuously monitors agent behavior to validate that they are um, acting in accordance to social norms. Uh, the planner module will correspond then to the fast system one that acts instinctually and um, reactively to the signals from the environment. And then the behavior library is that embodiment that um, the agents have shared access to. Um, specifically, it is consistent of the senses primitives that allow for the agent to perceive its environment and the actions that are primitives that serve as actuators for the agent to interact with its environment as well. Specifically, um, I want to also um, expand a little bit on what a reactive plan looks like. And so this planner will parse plans that are fed to it by the system engineer. Um, and it describes a collection of drives and a drive corresponds to behavior. The structure of the 
plan is very much uh, will very much determine the behavior of the agent in the environment. So um, hierarchy matters. It'll cycle through the plan and execute each drive in order. And um, each element drive element is uh, fired or executed in response to a sense condition. Um, in the environment. So as soon as the sense is satisfied, this element will begin running and the agent will exhibit this behavior for the duration that that sense is satisfied. Uh, so similarly, the uh, opera module has access to these senses to indicate when an interaction scene that is specified here um, by, again, the system uh, architect um, to, to indicate when a scene has begun and a social norm is to be abided by. And I'd like to go into a little bit more detail on what an interaction scene requires. So um, in interaction scene using Opera, we uh, specify a landmark for the start and the end of the scene. So this again is the senses in the environment. Then we have to specify also the roles that are involved in this interaction. And furthermore, we specify rules for the scene's duration that captures norms in form or using deontic operators for obligation and permission. So what this uh, rule might look like is an if-then statement where a role A, for example, is obliged to um, abide by a certain behavior, or um, if that is not the condition is not satisfied, um, they might not be permitted to behave in a certain in a certain way. And then in our implementation, we focused on the enforcement of these norms. So what Opera is doing is continuously checking the state of the agent, the awkward agent, and using, again, these sense elements and checks against norms encapsulated by the rules. If a violation is sensed and a violation occurs, then Opera has direct access to the agent's plan and can manipulate the plan in order for the norm to be satisfied. So for example, this might involve removing a drive that is not permitted. So to illustrate um, how this norm enfor enforcement might work, we implemented it. Um, we implemented a version of this in a popular video game called Dota 2. And without going into specifics of this game, I just wanna give a brief um, uh, idea of what uh, the objective is. It consists of two um, opposing teams made up of five heroes or agents uh, that need to battle it out on this map here and uh, attempt to defeat the enemy base on either end of the map. So it is a multiplayer real-time strategy game. And we chose this virtual environment for the complexity and the dynamic environment. So each hero um, has a, a distinct set of abilities. And uh, the interesting thing is the interaction between agents within a team. And this is the um, interaction that we want to study, and it is key for team success. So another um, uh, bit of background I'd like to elaborate on is this behavior of farming, where the agent delivers a killing blow to these enemy uh, minions called creeps and collects a bounty of gold. And this bounty will um, allow them to grow in, in um, thank you, I'm wrapping up soon, uh, to, to grow in, um, uh, uh, ability so that they can carry their team to victory. And the interaction scene that we defined using Opera is something called priority farming. We have two roles. One is position one and position five. And each position corresponds to their priority to collect this bounty um, uh, when they're in the same vicinity. So the rule that we want to encapsulate this norm is that if I have the highest priority around, I'm obliged to farm. Otherwise, I'm not permitted to farm at all. So what this looks like is um, here this position five is when opera enforces this norm is uh, not allowed to farm in lane and instead exhibits a different um, behavior. And it gives room for the position one to gather that bounty instead. So what we measured in game was this acquisition of gold in time. And what we see with this position one is the blue trend and position five is a red trend that when no opera intervention is, is allowed, their gold acquisition over time is on par. When opera enforces this norm, then there's a divergence in this gold acquisition. And this is indication of the social behavior that we want to see. So just as an illustration, it's a muting of this behavior, this farmling behavior and, and um, in the in the agent's plan, but then that begs the question of whether there's a, a better structure or or if these uh, if an enforcement needs to occur or if we can induce it um, using some other 
uh, method. And that's what motivates our ongoing extension of using reinforcement learning and a Q policy network to kind of reward with positive um, behavior of social behavior within these episodes or scenes uh, and negative rewards for if a non-social compliance uh, occurs. And our preliminary results are, are quite promising. We see um, a shuffling of the drives uh, such that healing an ally is number one priority and farming and lane is um, the least priority. And uh, this also allows for an induction and a, like encouragement of social behavior as opposed to an enforcement where we remove the drive in, uh, entirely. And Ultimately, this is, an element, uh, this is an idea of human control, where each module is in and of itself a decision-making module. And um, we ask, how can we make more room for explanations when it comes to signals from various modules, if we consider this an adjustable autonomy uh, system? And that's everything for today, just a little bit of food for thought, and I'm uh, open for questions. Thank you very much, Leila. So questions for Leila. Tony has a question. Please go ahead, Tony. Well, Leila, thank you for the nice presentation. I particularly enjoyed two things. Um, one is, uh, you know, the, the use, use of games. And more than that, I liked um, the use of um, the two levels, or uh, Kahani means two, two levels. Um, so what is actually quite interesting is how do you actually, um, you know, validate the update of level two? You know, you need to fire, um, you know, the slow thinking system at one point, and then the fast thinking system is triggered many, many times, right? So, how do you, how do you think you will get the balance right in terms of when this the system two, the higher level slow thinking system, um, triggered um, in your in in your system in the implementation? And how does how will that vary um, in the two different implementations you are providing? You know, I, I see that you're now using or you're thinking of using reinforcement learning. So how does that change? So it is it is definitely interesting, and, and I really liked your presentation. I just want to hear your thoughts on um, this this part. Thank you so much. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, you're saying how does this uh, the execution of the opera module change with this extension of reinforcement learning? Yeah, um, this is something that we are continuously uh, brainstorming currently. And um, in, uh, in particular, right now, what we have is an individual extension module that communicates um, with the awkward agent. But what we would like to do is have it integrated with the opera such that the it is not um, the learning module that is uh, offering a reward from the environment every time a social um, behavior is, or a, a social outcome rather than a behavior. So um, we are measuring the reward by outcome. Uh, so instead of the learning module offering that reward, we would like it for Opera to offer that reward. So um, the Opera module itself is the one that's measuring uh, differences in state and indicating, okay, this is a social outcome that can be rewarded, or this is a non-social outcome that is to be um, negatively rewarded. So uh, then the agent is pushed or encouraged to shuffle their drives uh, in response. To, to that. So um, instead of a hard enforcement, um, it's somewhat of a soft enforcement or encouragement uh, for social social behavior. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Just just to add on if, if I can. Um, so sure. are, are, the, are, the, are the norms dynamic in your system or are they hard coded in the, in the opera um, in the modules? So do you make the norms dynamic? Do the, you know, do they learn and do they change over time? And how was that incorporated in your system? As it stands, the uh, intention is for it to be hard coded so that it's something that we want to um, ensure is abided by. It's not something that we want to deviate um, out of our, our control, if, if I may say. So it's something that would be specified so that we can ensure and validate that it, the system is behaving as the human architect intended. So this is goes into a discussion of accountability and and being able to to track and and trace system changes. All right. Yeah. But but do you, do you have do you see cases where that could be changed? That was my I was leading towards that question sure, because I'm, usually I'm gonna... there is. Sorry. Oh please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I can see a scenario where um, norms could be learned, but um, I don't know if that's desirable in this in this circumstance in particular. 
but of course, right. uh, open to, to discussion. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Tony, for your question as well. Uh, okay. So maybe in the interest of time, we can move to the next presentation. Our next presentation is on computational theory of mind for human agent coordination. This by Emre Adukin, Frank Tignam, Renke Verbrugge, and Pinar Ulam. I think Emre is presenting. Yes, I will be the presenter today. Yes. Uh, so, what yeah. do you? Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Emre Emre Adukin. So, I'm doing my PhD. Sorry, we are not sharing your screen. I, I think. Ah, uh, yes, I will. I can oh, share that. Sure. Yeah, I think you can see also my screen. Yeah. Yes, OK, perfect. So yeah, uh, I'm doing my PhD in the Utrecht University uh, in Information and Computer Sciences Department. So uh, I'm going to give a presentation about our paper today. It's titled as Computational Theory of Mind for Human Agent Coordination. It's a joint work uh, with professors uh, Frank Lindon, Renéke Farwaha, and Mary Willem. Um, so, um, yeah, I can. Okay, so first, uh, I will very briefly talk about the theory of mind as the core notion of uh, our research. Uh, the theory of mind is the ability of reasoning about uh, the mental contact of other people, other uh, such as their beliefs, desires, uh, goals, and their uh, feelings. So, it helps us to understand, uh, analyze, and judge, and also infer other people's behavior. Uh, and we can recursively use this theory of mind uh, reasoning to reason about how others use their theory of mind ability. So, uh, and it's widely uh, known as the higher order theory of mind reasoning. And this ability particularly is deemed to be an important part of uh, our social cognition. And we use it to hone our social skills, uh, such as negotiating, teaching, even deceiving others, uh, which are very helpful uh, for adapting to the complex dynamics of social life. So, so to understand how theory of mind works, uh, various agent-based uh, computational models have been developed. And these models have been used to uh, analyze the effectiveness of theory of mind reasoning in uh, competitive, cooperative, mixed motive settings, as well as uh, for various tasks that include goal uh, inference and belief attribution for agents. And uh, in most of these studies, uh, we surveyed uh, that, that are around computational theory of mind models, uh, the results are generally uh, very promising and uh, demonstrate that the agents that are capable of using theory of mind reasoning and because they also achieve uh, better outcomes for the study tasks uh, uh, compared to the agents that cannot do theory of mind uh, reasoning. Um, but still, the existing models are not widely adopted as a computational tool uh, in, in real life settings. So that's that. Um, and yeah, so uh, um, we think that uh, an important area in which theory of mind can be of particular use is hybrid intelligence, where an agent can coordinate uh, with a human towards a specific goal, where both would have uh, varying capabilities that could complement those of the other uh, to yield uh, the goal. So. Uh, Ideally, we argue that for a theory of mind to be applicable for such real-life hybrid settings, uh, it needs to adhere to um, the following criteria that we draw here. Like first is uh, the genericness. Uh, so the theory of mind should be independent of a particular setting, uh, so that it can, so that the agent can use it in a variety of scenarios, tasks, and situations. And second, it should be feasible. Uh, like it should be guided by a control mechanism, which can sort out the, um, the relevant information for the uh, agents uh, and important information. And uh, also it should be human inspired. Uh, so it should be able to capture and interpret the heuristics, uh, the decision-making heuristics that humans use uh, in their everyday uh, life. So these heuristics can be emotions, feelings, or human values, uh, as well as social norms or uh, contextual roles. Um, so the long-term, the goal of our research is to develop a generic feasible human inspired theory of mind model, a computational model that can improve uh, human agent coordination and facilitate hybrid intelligence. And as an initial uh, step towards this goal, uh, we develop an abstraction framework uh, for computational theory of mind model. So here, uh, one can think of uh, abstraction as a way to employ beliefs and knowledge about the person 
uh, to produce more abstract, complex uh, mental states, uh, which can be useful by interacting with uh, that person in a given context. So for example, uh, one can think of about the feeling of affinity uh, as an abstraction. Uh, basically it summarizes like uh, how we relate to someone based on the things we know about that person or believe about that person, uh, such as the similarities that we share uh, with that person, like similarity of uh, qualities, qualities we share, the interests, the background. And uh, um, so based on these uh, beliefs and knowledge, uh, we can think about whether we feel affinity towards another person or not, and use this uh, feeling, this kind of feeling, say, uh, accordingly in our interactions. So for example, uh, we can be generous towards a, such a person because we feel affinity towards them. And so to computationally, uh, actually what we call an abstraction mechanism is an agent apparatus. Uh, that first takes a set of beliefs and knowledge as inputs, as you can see in the first uh, layer, and uh, using a, a shared uh, characteristic of such inputs, um, it produces an intermediate output in the, in the form of a um, simple yet more abstract list or piece of knowledge. In, in this case, because uh, abstraction, which also shares the same characteristics with the uh, other the beliefs and knowledge uh, produced by. And also applying uh, rules that govern the rule of uh, that intermediate output in, in context, it produces interaction states for the agent to operate in. So here, the first layer actually holds the agent's set of beliefs and knowledge about others, and it, it comes from like different uh, sources, such as observations or uh, like explicit state of information from others. Uh, others, and um, while the agent uh, can get the set. It can operate on that level and create uh, abstractions uh, um, in the second level. And uh, the first level like influences the second level. So, for example, if something changes in the changes in the first level, something is updated. Uh, the abstractions in the second level might also change. And the abstractions is also in the second level levels. How they operate in the third level. So, as we said, affinity can be a good example for uh, such an interaction state. So that being said, uh, we come back to our example, like affinity as an abstraction. And here we claim that uh, affinity can be computationally captured within our abstraction mechanism, in which like one can merge many uh, beliefs and uh, pieces of knowledge in the first layer, such as the similarity between the two agents, uh, into a more abstract belief that shares the same characteristic, like in second layer, which is uh, again a general similarity in our case. And also uh, then an interaction uh, state uh, of affinity in the third layer, uh, which can be more effectively used by making decisions uh, instead of using all the beliefs and knowledge repeatedly uh, for making that decision. So in our case, uh, like affinity can also be used to generate a generous behavior. Uh, an example can be doing a favor. Uh, for the other agents. Um, so continuing. Um, furthermore, um, we claim that uh, affinity uh, maps naturally with theory of mind reasoning. So uh, thinking and uh, generating affinity is a universal thing and uh, people uh, observe to find and commit, communicate to all these similarities and uh, can use the theory of mind ability to benefit from others' affinity and also affinity in those generosity. And in our framework, we want our agents to, to not just establish affinity towards other agents, but uh, also attribute it as a mental state to others as people do and benefits uh, also accordingly. So uh, what we've done is like to demonstrate the usage of um, affinity in human agent interaction, we employ it in a two agent, negotiation, uh, two agent single issue negotiation setting, a simple setting. And the goal of an agent is here, thank you, uh, to forge an agreement uh, while negotiating. And uh, to do that, it can make offers for offers made by other agents. Uh, and it's, it's, the agent also has opinions, which are basically Boolean tokens that the agent can share uh, with the other agents. For example, like healthy living is important, yes, no. Um, and also the agent can compare a told opinion with his own opinion on the same subject. And if these two opinions uh, are the same or not, and this is actually uh, the essential part of establishing affinity in our framework. 
and uh, basically uh, an agent decides uh, whether to uh, let's say feel affinity towards the other agent through these shared and compared opinions. Um, so we have two kinds of agents with respect to the theory of mind reasoning uh, ability in our framework. The first one is um, zero to arbitrary uh, theory of mind agent. It's an established affinity towards other agents and used to behave generously when negotiating and it can do that via uh, comparing the uh, shared opinions. And uh, the second one is first order theory of mind agent, and it doesn't only establish affinity towards other agents, but also attribute affinity as a mental state of others, as people do. And essentially, this agent uh, has this type of agent as a theory of mind about other agents and can reason uh, whether another agent has an affinity towards itself or not uh, through observed behavior. And we claim that the first order theory of mind agent can use this uh, ability uh, to its benefit. For example, it can limit its own generous behavior to the other agent's generous behavior after comparing uh, the negotiation process. So we are interested in understanding the role of affinity and theory of mind reasoning in getting to agreements when there's a bond on the time uh, spent for negotiating. So to analyze it, uh, we have done uh, simple simulation experiments with zero to order and first order theory of mind agents that coordinates towards uh, forging agreements through negotiation and communication, communication of uh, opinions. Though I will not go into the experiment details, of, I, I don't have time. Uh, but our initial findings suggest that uh, explicitly modeling affinity can ease this uh, agreement process in negotiations, uh, where generating generous behavior as we expected. And sharing similarities can help agents uh, forge more agreements, uh, as we saw. And also we saw that when negotiating with agents that do not have a theory of mind reasoning, agents that have a theory of mind reasoning, the zero sort of, uh, first order agents end up with agreements that are uh, more favorable to them than to their opponents, as we expected. So the, the results provide us uh, the motivation to uh, develop more sophisticated agents uh, that can generate affinity and use it to their um, benefit. So what we aim, what we uh, do, uh, what we do as a follow-up work, um, we aim for a more detailed model uh, that captures the ways the humans abstract their beliefs and knowledge. So we will start with the formalization from tip to toe, like the beliefs and abstractions and the procedure itself, etc. Uh, and uh, we need to use, we need to answer a couple of fundamental questions here, such as uh, which beliefs to use when abstracting, when to stop the procedure, like what to do in a belief update, uh, which heuristics to model as interaction states like trust or respect. And all. So, um, furthermore, we uh, also consider from benefiting uh, other uh, from different other uh, perspectives like value based reasoning and mind perception theory uh, to develop a more comprehensive and human inspired uh, theory of mind model. So, uh, with that, with a more detailed agent model, uh, we plan to further um, further analyze how affinity can be used within other negotiation and communication strategies and as well as uh, get a broader view of its uh, effects in uh, also, not in also single issue, but also multi-issue negotiations as well. Uh, so uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. Um, yes. Thank you, Andre. Uh, yeah. I hope I, I didn't exceed the time limit, but. Yes, almost, yeah, almost uh, there. So maybe we can have one quick question. Um, please feel free to unmute and ask ask a question. Remember? Okay. So maybe I, I can take this opportunity. So you, you, Emre, you talked about hybrid intelligence quite a lot initially. So uh, how how do you see like what, what could you give an example of what would hybrid intelligence mean and like uh, just or uh, yes, uh, in also our uh, paper, we gave uh, an example about how um, this hybrid intelligence can work uh, in, uh, in, in, in the setting in a, in a, in a simple way. So uh, we thought of a, um, um, yeah, a variable activity monitor agent like Fitbit. Uh, as, a, as an agent that can uh, talk with a human and can they can uh, together coordinate towards um, a negotiation for to the steps to be taken daily so uh, the agent can nudge the, uh, the, 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 the 
the AI agent can match the uh, human agents for that. Like, let's uh, let's have uh, let's say five thousand um, steps today, and uh, human can negotiate with uh, the the agent. So if 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 I don't like feel like uh, having um, that amount of steps to be taken, so I can also uh, give my offer to that, and then we can negotiate towards uh, such an uh, agreement. Uh, so. That would be uh, for the for benefit of myself, but I will also uh, in need of uh, such a negotiation for uh, that to happen. So that can be a case that uh, we talked about. Okay, thank thank you, Emre. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we, we can now move uh, to the next presentation. Okay. The last presentation for this session. Uh, the next presentation is effective task allocation in ad hoc human agent teams. It is by Sami Abu Hamid and Sandeep Sain. Over to you, Sami. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for um, making this possible. Um, um, my name is Sami Abu Hamid. I'm a PhD. I'm a PhD candidate at the Tandy School of Computer Science at the, the University of Tulsa, uh, working with Professor Sandipson. Uh, I'm excited to present this paper to you today. Um, the, the title of it is uh, Effective Allocation Protocols for Ad Hoc uh, Human Agent Teams. Uh, hope you enjoy it. So recently we have been um, observing an increased capabilities of agents. Um, and because of that, agents are being allocated to new roles and new, new tasks and new domains in human agent teams. Um, we, we, we see uh, smart rooms uh, that include agents to help the business teams make decisions. Uh, medical, medical teams, they have uh, agents at discharge nurses. Uh, oh, and agents are also um, being used in therapeutic activities um, to motivate people. Uh, we see basketball management teams uh, work with agents for talent selection and also in critical tasks such as guiding emergency, emergency evacuations and disaster relief. And we receive these teams as well in diverse domains, um, space robotics, advising, um, therapy, command and control, and decision making. Uh, because of this, new coordination mechanisms, team designs, and incentives are emerging. One such environment that's uh, emerging is ad hoc environment. An ad hoc, an ad hoc uh, team setting is one in which teammates must work together to obtain a common objective but without any prior agreement regarding how to work together. Um, human agent teams can encounter, can, can encounter task allocation problems, uh, mechanism of dividing tasks among agents who may have preferences. Um, effective task allocation, uh, an effective task allocation that harness team members' expertise is key to team performance. Um, task allocation is, study in, uh, is studied in human team and organization literature. In human organization, teams strive to find um, the best task allocation mechanisms uh, for team member characteristics. Um, however, in that literature, there is little work um, in the presence of autonomous agents. Task allocation is also studied ex extensively in multi-agent teams. Uh, the focus uh, a focus here is in designing efficient mechanisms for agents to share tasks. And again, and, and this literature as well, um, uh, field work includes um, human teammates. Um, the, the study of task allocation with combined human and agent team members is promising. The, the, the few existing work do not empirically investigate the area. It's focused on industrial settings. They configure the agent and support in roles we are interested in autonomous peers. Uh, and it's not clear whether human participants uh, receive training prior to the experiments making the scenario not ad hoc. We are interested in ad hoc environments. Our objective in this paper 
is to investigate the effect of different allocation mechanisms for facilitating coordination and performance in ad hoc human agent teams. So what, what, what's, what's the contributions of this paper? We, we, we developed uh, an allocation mechanisms or protocols for improving team effectiveness or performance. Um, we developed agent strategy for to allocate tasks that fits in ad hoc environment. And, and we also develop an evaluation environment to test these mechanisms and strategies. And we conduct also a user study that, that to investigate the effects of different allocation mechanisms on team performance. Let's go and look at our evaluation environment. Uh, our evaluation environment, we call it Chatboard. Uh, in short, it's a collaborative human agent task board. It's an environment for facilitating human agent and human human collaboration. As you can see in the right figure, this is the, uh, the this is the human allocator protocol where the human is allocating. Uh, at, and uh, at the top, we can see the sh uh, general task board. This is a shared repository similar to the uh, Blackboard, where um, team members have access to the the, the tasks that needs to be assigned uh, and completed. The left side, we can see that this is the human board, and to the right side, this is the human task board. In the middle, we can see um, uh, that the agent preferences or, or or confidence levels for each task type, and and also see the way uh, to do the task allocation. The, the, the framework allows for displaying tasks to be completed. It, it, uh, it, it supports multiple task allocation protocols and communication by expressing preferences. And also after each episode or each interaction, uh, the, the, the task performances uh, by the team members uh, can be viewed as well. So this is uh, uh, shared information. Uh, we can see in the bottom graph, uh, this is a post allocation. Um, you can see the task has been allocated to uh, both team members. We also developed two interaction protocols uh, they, that, that are differentiated by um, the, alloc the allocator role, the human allocator role, and the agent allocator role. And the left side shows the steps for the human allocator role, and the right side shows the steps for the agent allocator role. Uh, as you can see, um, both protocols encapsulate uh, preference sharing, uh, task allocation, um, accomplish tasks, and this goes on for, um, as we configure it uh, for four episodes. So how do we, um, uh, so what's our procedure here? So we, we designed experiments to evaluate the relative effects of the two protocols on team performance. Uh, we did that bet between subject design and run our uh, experiments on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, and our measures, we start with the human variability. Uh, we, we measure human variability within the stated confidence levels and, with, and within performances. Um, we, we also measure um, miscalibration and variability of humans over task types as a difference between uh, the human teammates stated confidence levels and their actual performances. We analyze the differences in mean performances um, and for, for team performance. Uh, team performance is a percentage of assigned tasks successfully completed uh, uh, our episodes. And we also looked at uh, adaptivity, adaptivity and learning, uh, so team improvement. Um, so because it's an ad hoc scenario, it's required, the agent is required to quick learn, um, the test, task allocators are required to quick learn uh, for improvement in team performance. So we analyze um, averages of each episode, and we also analyze um, a weighted average, which gives higher weights uh, to performances in lat latest or lat latter episodes. We also uh, measure potential realization, which is the utilized capacity of team members, uh, basically individual performances of uh, team members. Um, we, we configure the environment with the uh, uh, four task types. Uh, the first one is identify language, which is in the top right. Um, as you can see there. The second one is solve for a uh, solve or grid. This is the top left. The third one is identifying landmark, which is the bottom right. And the fourth one is identify events, which is the, the bottom left. Uh, we pick these types since it doesn't require specialization, but can produce uh, variability within, within the human population. 
and, and that's kind of necessary for online learning and adaptation. Um, we, we use eight instances uh, per episodes, uh, and we use also four, four episodes. Let's look at some results. We analyze human variability within stated confidence levels and within performance over task types. We, we start with analyzing human variability in their stated confidence levels using a one-way ANOVA. Um, we found a significant difference in confidence levels. As, you, as we can see in the right graph, um, which shows the, the distribution of the stated confidence levels, we also found a significant difference in actual performance levels, uh, as we can see in the left graph as well. Let's move on and look at the performance uh, results. Um, we found a significant difference in uh, team performance between the agent allocator protocol and the human allocator protocol. The agent is outperforming the human. And, um, and since the teams are working uh, in an ad hoc environment, task allocators need to uh, quickly learn about team capabilities and increase uh, team performance. If we look at the graph, um, the, agent, uh, uh, the agent is in the uh, orange um, uh, line and the uh, uh, human is in the blue one. Uh, the agent allocator starts with, uh, with lower performance than the human allocator in the first episode. This is due to the agent's strategy of exploration during the first episode. However, the agent improves quickly and outperforms the human in the second, third, fourth episodes. The agent improves team performance by a significant margin going from episode one to two, and then by smaller ones uh, or small margins going from two to three, and then three to four. We also uh, measured the uh, uh, weighted performance, which gives more weight to the thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, which gives more late, uh, more weight to the um, later episodes. Uh, and uh, again, the agent is outperforming the human here as well. But lastly, um, we look at e uh, at how each allocator, whether the human or agent, realizes uh, um, uh, how they realize the potential of team members. We compare the difference in, uh, in the potential utilized by human and agent allocators. Uh, the question here is who utilizes human and agent capacity better? We find a significant difference in realizing human potential between the, the two protocols. The agent is realizing um, more human uh, potential uh, than the human from itself. If we look at the right graph, and look at the two allocators and compare the orange uh, bars, we can see that, that the agent is realizing more human potential than the human from themselves. Uh, similarly, the agent is also realizing more capacity from themselves the, uh, more than the agent realizing of the agent. Uh, so if we compare the blue, um, blue bars, we can see the agent is realizing more for itself than the, than the human realizing of the agent. Uh, lastly, um, uh, we, uh, the study of human agent teams in ad hoc environments and task allocation demands is limited, and our, our paper uh, can contribute to that. Um, we, we presented uh, uh, or developed a chatbot as a flexible task allocation framework. We presented two coordination protocols and team designs. Um, uh, we, uh, we developed agent task allocation strategies for ad hoc teamwork and demonstrated uh, uh, through a user studies that agent allocators generally increase the quality of uh, the human agent teams. Um, as future work, we, uh, we plan to evaluate the effect of different agent expertise distributions on team performances and also study the, how the dynamics of these teams change when, when, when we have more than two members. Um, this concludes my presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sami. Let us thank our speaker. Any questions for Sami? Please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Okay. Uh, Maybe I, I can take this opportunity. So, so you. So, uh, one thing that I wanted to know was like, uh, what would be the threat to validity of your experiment that you're conducting? Because I, I see that you conducted it on, uh, on I think Amazon Mechanical Turk. So, uh, and then there would be threats when we're trying to design teams on the fly. So, so what do you think about that? 
Well, um, thanks, thank you for your question. Uh, mechanical Amazon Turk is an established um, environment to, to analyze uh, or study human participants. However, um, I think the population of Amazon Turk um, are, are online. So they're representative of humans who are online. Um, we don't know uh, how, how is that, uh, how is that the, the, the study would work in um, uh, say physical environments. Um, so that's, that's, that could be a threat there. Uh, but in general, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a well-accepted environment in, uh, uh, for uh, studying human participants. Okay. Yeah, one thing that I was looking at, it was like you had uh, in, in your screenshot, you had uh, someone stated as agent and someone is uh, stated as human. If, if, if I see that I'm, I'm playing with an agent, uh, I, I may have a bias so considering like if I know the other person is human. So does, does, do you, are you taking that part into account when you're doing that? So in the once once the human participants come to the study, they they uh, the way that the study information is presented is that they know they will be working with the agent. Uh, so it's they they, they it's uh, we tell them that that they will be working with the agent and uh, a software agent, and you'll be collaborating and coordinating together. So it's it's they are aware of it. So they they are always always working with the agent. Okay, I I, yes. I, I probably misunderstood that part. I, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yep. Probably this concludes our session one. Uh, I think we are running late. Uh, maybe we can take maybe a shorter break. Uh, what do you suggest, Tony? I think that sounds good. Maybe a five minute break before we convene again. Um, so we need to make up, make up for our lost time as well. So instead of a 10 minute break, let's have a five minute break. Um, so we'll be back in five minutes. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. I see Munin that you are here. You want to try screen sharing and audio? Yeah, the audio should work, I, I yeah. guess. Yes, yes. I have, yeah. I have a yeah, bit of a cough going, but oh, other than that. No. And you see the slide? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's all. It's all good. Yeah. So how did you? Uh, I think you allocated forty-five minutes to me total. I mean, we can go a little less than that. Uh, sure. What's your, what's your ratio? I mean, of uh, I, or the split between me talking and discussions. What was your idea? So I think. So I was actually thinking, uh, you know, 40 minutes and five minutes, but I think if you want to make it 35 minutes and 10 minutes, that, that should be okay. Or do you want it more conversational? That will also be okay. As long as we have, um, you know. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to do that. I'll try to. Uh, make it conversational? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, I have slides, but I, I, I don't, uh, I won't dwell on them too much and maybe have more time for discussion. Yeah, sure. I think, I think that sounds good. Yeah. So after, after Maureen this talk, we also have two um, papers that are presented. Um, are, are the um, presenters here? Um, do you want to quickly see whether your screen sharing works? Okay, so, I can do that. Yes, um, Natasha. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can also check if your screen is working. Oops, um, I think I need to first uh, uh, select the talk, uh, sorry. That's okay. Is the presenter for the other paper, the short paper titled Centralized Norm Enforcement and Mixed Motor Multi-Agent Reinforcement Learning here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, hi, Rafael. Um, yeah, after after Natasha checks, you can also check whether you're able to share your presentation. Yes, so yeah, we can yeah. see we can we can see that Natasha, it looks fine. Can, okay. Yeah, all good. Okay. Good. Okay, just try to. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah, it works, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it works. Okay. Excellent, thank you. I think our five minutes is up, so we can actually make a, make a start. Um, so I hope all of you are ready and I hope you had a stretch. Um, so well, well, welcome to the second session of, of COIN. Um, so in this session, um, we'll have a keynote speech. Um, um, the keynote speech will be provided by um, Professor Muninder Singh, and we'll also have a couple of papers, um, one, one full and one short papers. Um, so I'll provide a brief introduction um, uh, to Professor Maninder Singh. Um, he definitely needs uh, no introduction at all, but, uh, but it's a privilege for me to provide an introduction for him. Um, so Professor Singh is an alumni distinguished graduate professor at the Department of um, Computer Science at the North Carolina State University. And he has varied research interests. I've known him for 15 years. Every time I speak to him, um, you know, he works in, a, you know, in, in lots of different areas. So it's, it's quite exciting to talk to him every time to see the various fields he covers. So he primarily works in artificial intelligence, multi-agent systems, um, service-oriented computing, cybersecurity, and, and privacy. And um, um, Munindar is a um, senior uh, researcher and a well-renowned um, researcher. Um, who has held several prominent governance roles in research. Uh, he, um, he was the editor-in-chief of ACM uh, Transactions on um, Internet Technology, IEEE um, Internet Computing, to, to state a few. And um, he has held um, very senior roles um, um, in the multi-agent system community. Um, he was one of the founding directors of um, IFAMAS, um, and he has been a um, general co-chair of the AMS conference in 2005 and International Conference on Service-Oriented Computing in 2016. And he has also won several awards. Uh, to just name a few, um, he won the ACM Autonomous Agents um, Research Award and IFAMAS Influential Paper Award, just to name a few. And um, Professor Singh is... Um, um, not an outsider to the coin community. He actually has worked in all the topics from um, that we saw um, early on um, um, in the in the um, opening remarks. He has worked on all the all the pillars of um, coin, and in particular, he he has made several influential contributions to the normative multi-agent systems um, in particular. Um, so, as a PhD student, this was um, like. 15 years ago, I used to read several of his papers uh, relating to commitment protocols and commitment machines. I'm not sure whether Professor Singh still works in these areas, but uh, these, are the go these were the go-to papers for me when I was a PhD student. And recently, you know, um, recently meaning in the last um, seven years or, or so, um, you know, one of my go-to papers from him is norms as the basis of governing socio-technical systems. Um, and I do refer several of his works to my own PhD students. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us, um, Muninder. You have worked with us, with this community for a very, very long time. And it's a pleasure for, for, um, for us to have you give um, a keynote speech. And this keynote speech is quite special because it touches upon 
a relatively new topic in coin, which is on, um, on ethics. So as you may um, realize, this, is, this topic was added to the five pillars of coin only recently in 2020. Um, so the topic today um, is um, consent as a foundation um, for responsible autonomy. Um, so this, is, this I believe is a, um, um, a paper that was also presented in um, Ichikai. Um, so without further ado, I give you Professor Muninder Singh so, so thank you, Muninder, for giving this talk. And as Muninder said in a conversation, he wants to keep this talk conversational. So it is going to be a dialogue um, and we'll have the opportunity to engage with them during, during the talk. Thank you, Muninder, over to you. Uh, thanks, Rudy. Thanks for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, actually, it was 16 years ago when I visited uh, Otago, uh, 2006, right. and I was... Hoping to visit New Zealand again, uh, you know, to, uh, I think both times that we try to have a must there. Uh, and, I, and I hope there are other opportunities to travel uh, in, in person. Yes, uh, yeah, so sure. I, I, yeah, yeah. I really I welcome this opportunity to, uh, to give this uh, presentation here. Uh, this was earlier, um, an earlier version of this is, is, in, is in the AAAI Blue Sky uh, track of this year. But I think this is the one I'm talking about today is a much more, uh, much better version than what the AAAI audience got from me. Um, yeah, so yeah. As, as Tony said, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, you know, I want to keep it in, um, informal and more of a, as much of a discussion as we can manage. Uh, I try to make the talk more interesting than, uh, you know, than dry. Uh, there are a few parts that are dry, but uh, I have, I think something like 12 or so cartoons in it. So I hope, I hope they're at least keep you, keep you interested. Um, okay, so we are going to talk about consent. Um, so just look at it here. So you know we are interested in, uh, in in building systems of you know with agents and people, right? So that's kind of our our thing in this community. Uh, we're talking about uh, societal and individual objectives coming into play when they build those systems, and we can we want to realize these as socio technical systems, which balance these societal and uh, individual uh, objectives of the participants. And thinking about social technical systems leads us inevitably to talk about autonomy. And if you're talking about autonomy, we should be talking about responsibility because otherwise you know, we'd have a lot of trouble on our hands. But if you want to talk about autonomy and responsibility, that means you know, we're really talking about governance. And uh, in particular, if you're going to talk about governance, we should be talking about you know, consent, about you know, representing and reasoning about consent properly. So this is the, the motivation here that you know, we want social technical systems, uh, we want governance to achieve you know, um, uh, ethical outcomes and we, want, we need consent as a way to achieve that, uh, that good kind of governance. So here are, uh, uh, here's an example. So this, is, this is the joke um, you know, at the top, somebody saying, you know, does anyone feel like they're being watched? <laughs> and then the CIA has a thing, they're correcting the spellings of their, okay? they are uh, being watched. So this is an example you could think of as, a governmental uh, overreach of sorts, or this, uh, you know, I, I'll uh, assume that the joke is being taken literally or whatever, even in most, most of these cases. Uh, so this person is not given, has not given consent to being washed, but they think they are being washed, right? That's the, that's the situation. Uh, just as, as much as the governmental uh, situation, we have uh, private companies doing stuff for us. So here we see, so this is more of an American custom, like kids might set up a table somewhere where they sell lemonade for, you know, usually it's for 25 cents, like one coin, right, a quarter. Uh, in this case, you know, there are two adults who say, talking to each other and one of them is saying it's free, but they sell your information. So I guess that reminds us, a lot of us, of a lot, a lot of what goes on in social media. Uh, so, so here we have, again, the case where information is being used up, but you know, not in a way that's not been consented to, right? It's a violation of consent here as well. And then this is the third one, which uh, uh, maybe alludes a bit to Pablo Picasso, so at least the cubist style. Um, uh, here we have uh, two people being shown in the very, you know, with the distorted images. And uh, the woman is saying, oh, hello, my eyes are over here. And of course, the joke here is that uh, in the cubist picture, you don't really know where somebody's eyes are, so she's pointing them out. Uh, but clearly, it refers to um, a situation where you know sh she doesn't like 
this person looking at her a certain way, right? So it's kind of lack of consent in, in that realm. So when they put it together, you know, consent shows up in various places. So there is the personal domain of consent, which is kind of like the, the cubist example as part of it, you could say, maybe, you know, not just sex, but also risk would be a factor. There's the governmental aspects. And it's not just with privacy, it's also with the notion of, you know, tacit consent, like the consent of the governed, which is the foundation of political science, uh, arguably. There's similar notions in healthcare. I didn't have a picture of that, but, you know, how treatments are given, how information is shared. And of course, in computing, you know, when we are um, dealing with uh, privacy, we're dealing with contracts. So consent shows up in, you know, a variety of places, including computing. Uh, what makes consent worthwhile are, are these uh, factors. So there's this beautiful term by uh, a couple of legal scholars called the moral magic of consent. And really what's going on is that consent is what makes, is what's making some actions morally legitimate. So, you know, whether you're helping or intruding, whether I'm, you know, if I, if I, if I go sit on your sofa uh, uh, and eat your food or whatever, you know, it could be a criminal trespass, or it could be that you had me over as a guest, right? And the difference is really in the in the consent. It makes it just, you know, the, your consent makes something justified with the lack of consent would make, uh, you know, an illegitimate action. And the same thing applies not just to the moral legitimacy, but also to the legal legitimacy. Like if, I, if I'm borrowing, you know, your, uh, your car versus stealing your car, you know, legally it depends on whether you gave consent or not. And it also, in a way, it's, it's a way to, you could think of it as, you know, more computationally as transferring accountability. It's a way to override uh, defaults. By giving consent, you know, some things that are not allowed, like I can't barge into your, uh, you know, into your house, uh, but by default, but we can override that default, but, you know, by you having me invite, uh, you inviting me over. So when we talk about uh, uh, consent in general, we, I think of it as involving two parties, the consenter and the consentee. That's kind of the traditionally, uh, traditional notion. Uh, in computing, people will pitch it as consenter versus software, which I think is a, is a bogus view. It's really never like that. It's more like the consenter and the software, but the software itself is representing some consentee. And for us in AI, you know, we're dealing with a multi-agent situation where the consenter and the consentee both have agents. So I might give consent to my agent so that my agent can then give consent to your agent so that your agent can do something uh, on, on our behalf. Uh, you know, in, in that sense. Um, there, there's a, you know, fair bit of work on responsibility in AI. Uh, there's the, you know, broad theme of responsible AI, which is about how to build and deploy AI applications. Uh, it's, uh, I think of it as maybe more of a static picture about design methodologies and value-based design, which are, you know, useful uh, properties. Uh, I, I think I also want to draw attention to responsible autonomy, which is that the agent is, is actually a runtime uh, exercising autonomy and behaving responsibly. So it's about the decision making that it's applying. Uh, it's the values that it's bringing to bear its own values as well as those of the others. And consent is of course useful for both of them, you know, to develop responsible agents on the one hand and to understand responsibility broadly speaking. Uh, so we know what the requirements are. Uh, motivation for uh, consent, um, very simply it's that, you know, it helps us think about when it's appropriate to violate norms. You know, when we, so how can you exercise your autonomy by giving uh, consent as it were? And how do you make sure you take consent from others so that you act appro appropriately? Even if you violate a norm, if it's with the consent of the other that tells you that the norm itself is strong, you know, it's, it's a special case where the, where the consent was given. And then the benefits to society would be that we would uh, be able to align norms and values. We'd be able to engender trust in the AI. Um, I won't dwell into this, but I'll save it for discussion later. But if some of you may recall, you know, the famous work from McCarthy and Hayes about the adequacies of representation. And the argument I'd make is that consent is useful for the three elements, metaphysical, epistemological, and heuristic. Um, uh, where do we see consent? Uh, I won't dwell too much into it. There's the political science notion I mentioned, but uh, tacit consent in particular. Uh, there are models of uh, business contracts which talk about consent as well. And of course, in you know, social relations in, in general, you know, consent shows up uh, a lot, even in informal kinds of uh, settings. This I want to discuss a little bit more. So no notice and choice is the, uh, is the default way in which consent is used in computer science. So you know, if, you, if you download an app, it'll say, you know, 
uh, or you want to install something, it'll say yes or no, right? It sort of makes you choose. Or if you if you go to a website, they'll they'll have you accept cookies or something. You know, so this is a popular kind of an approach where the idea is we notify the user, you tell the user what's going on, then you say, you know, click here to continue. And it's extremely easy to implement. You know, there are you know, the like you know web uh, web languages make it easy, like HTML and so on, to have dialog boxes. Um, but it turns out to be a really horrible approach, broad, you know, in, in broad terms. In, in a way, what it does is uh, it doesn't fully explain the context of where consent is being applied. There's often the power difference. Like, you know, you're in a rush to do something. You know, you'll click yes on whatever comes along. You don't maybe know what the, you know, what you're consenting to, what the repercussions of it are, because there'll be a, you know, 10 or a 20 page document. And they say, you know, you read this uh, agreement and you're done, right? So they, they put you, force you into a corner. Um, so, so we so we don't like that. So, what is consent? In, in the legal literature, there are um, maybe two main bodies of work. So, one body of work is the mental action, because they think of legal actions as fully intentional. So, they'll say, well, you know, consent is an internal action that you're taking. It's what you think. That's what makes it consent. So, if I think that um, you told me to, you know, take your car, then that's good enough in, in a way. But that seems a bit flaky because, you know, if you're just thinking about it, how does it lead to norms. The opposite style, uh, opposite of approach would you say, well, there's an explicit sort of a message or a, or a document which says, you know, here's consent, which will confer uh, powers on this on somebody, right? Confer the power of, you know, take, taking your car, for example. But then, you know, this doesn't quite handle mistakes because sometimes people can mistakenly give you consent. And in the legal literature, they have interesting cases about like, you know, the situations and they, they get into more interesting <laughs> cases than we do in computer science. Like, uh, one is that a woman decides to, uh, you know, sleep with a famous actor, and then she realizes later that she was just confused with somebody else. You know, so did she con consent to sleeping with the famous person, or, uh, you know, and that's the case where they will worry about. But I think so they they get lost in in, in these kinds of uh, distinction between the mental and the communicator. And I think I think what we can do better is to think of it not in in terms of purely just solely just mental or solely just communicative, but in terms of uh, pragmatic social action. That if you think of social action, uh, you know, it would be mental and communicative in some ways, and we can evaluate it for legitimacy. Uh -huh. And how do we evaluate from legitimacy is, is this notion, well, the notion of social action tell, leads us to it. Uh, this was work done by uh, a famous philosopher, Jürgen uh, uh, Habermas, and he talked about public communications as it were, you know, public actions. And he's talking about, he introduces three validity claims. So the first is family of claims is objective, like it's something true, which you can evaluate empirically. The second is uh, subjective, meaning that, you know, is this communicative action sincere, which means, you know, do you have the right beliefs and intentions and so on, which you may not be able to evaluate directly empirically, but you may be able to argue about. And then, you know, is it justified, which means that it is suited to its societal context and so on. So keeping these in mind, uh, I thought it'd be good to develop uh, our criteria for consent. So, uh, so, so in a way, the rest of this talk is about sort of understanding these requirements. You know, what what is what is good consent? And I describe it in terms of uh, nine requirements that I uh, postulate, and there are nine uh, cartoons to justify uh, these nine requirements. And then I have I'll return to our uh, original cases to uh, to evaluate them together. So this is a cartoon. I'll, uh, I'll let you see it, but I can I can read it out. So it's, think there's, it's a bartender standing here. There's a unicorn, uh, and the bartender has served the unicorn with some something that contains a lot of uh, you know fancy stuff, like you know what presumably a unicorn would like. So and the unicorn is complaining, saying, "Did I say sprinkles? Did I say fufra? Did I flavors and swirls? Or did I say give me a damn scotch?" So so the the idea is that uh the unicorn has not in this case granted consent for any of this because the unicorn just said give me a damn scotch and is getting something else instead right so it's a clear public communication which has been violated by the uh by the bartender in this case in fact i think all but uh, one of my examples are sort of bad examples in that they're non-examples so this is a case of not a case of good consent it's a violation of consent okay um Similarly, here's another one. So here we have uh, a man and a woman uh, seemingly on a dinner date. The man is tied up and uh, she's saying, I don't want you to be the one that got away. So he's, he's consenting to be, or 
it's, it's a violation of consent here too because he's being forced to stay here. He's being, you know, literally uh, tied in here. So his violation of free will in this case, that's sort of the, the name I give this uh, criterion. Okay, this is yet another one. So here are a few people, but noticeably one of the characters has, uh, you know, these fancy like the ram's horns and trotters or whatever, you know, the, the, the legs are different. And is saying that let's just let's just say I thought I had one wish left. So presumably this person asked for three wishes and didn't count correctly. So so in this case I would say that the the problem is that the the beliefs of the consenter were not true in this case because he, he expected to have there be one more wish and he didn't have it. So you couldn't really undo any of these these odd things. Um, Capacity, this is actually very difficult to find a good cartoon for, but I'll, I'll, I'll use this. So the capacity is the idea of, you could say competence as it were, mental, mental competence. So here we have a case where somebody's saying, you know, I found a book on hypnosis and I, I something if I knew what I could do. Um, and then they say, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go make dinner for you now. So this person's consenting to make dinner, presumably because this other person has hypnotized uh, uh, the, the 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 guy here, so she sent him off to uh, to make dinner. So in a way, he's not he's not exercising his mental competence, right? He's not uh, thinking straight. So he's being uh, the, Another case of mental comp incompetence would be when there somebody was really just like in a coma, for example. But then they would be wouldn't be given consent as such. So normally, when there is a contract, people say that you're when you're signing in the contract, then you don't have. Uh, Say dementia, for example, or or and so on. You know, so you're mentally fit to be able to uh, enter into a contract. And this is more subtle now. So this is the case where what we see is um, a, a therapist sitting next to a patient. The patient is holding his you know his face as if he has uh, a dental pain. And and what this guy is saying is, so, so you see, what you were really looking for was a deeper connection with your father. And not the dentist's office down the hall. So the the this guy apparently the patient was going to a dentist's office, got cornered by the therapist, uh, and is being is still suffering. So he he never gave consent to the therapy because he believed he was going to a dentist's office, not to the therapist's office, right? So there's that. I guess I'm killing all the jokes, you know. So <laughs> that's the that's the unfortunate side of analysis, right? So uh, here's another one. Uh, and what this shows is a wedding going on, and in the wedding, uh, well, there's a priest, a, br a bride and groom, and a couple of other people, and everybody's on their phone, and the priest is asking a question to which the bride suddenly gives a reply, saying that you know she just barely <laughs> noticed what's going on. She said, "Well, yeah, I do." You know, so she wasn't uh, wasn't paying attention. So again, so they they may have the mental faculties, but they're not exercising them. So and and this is a a, a real problem with consent that often we are. We are clicking through and giving consent where we don't really know what's going on, right? We, have, we haven't even bothered to look uh, closely. Uh, another one, a statutory, uh, uh, I call the statutes here. You know, there's a guy who's gone to hell apparently. And uh, at hell, he's talking to the devil and he's saying, you know, why wasn't a list of these sins made available to me? And why wasn't I allowed to have it examined by my own expert? So he was never, <laughs> never given the opportunity to make corrections. So, so this is a statutory sort of a violation, you know, kind of like the, the equivalent of, uh, uh, like the, you know, the police rights, like in, in, in the US, they have the Miranda rights. And I think they're similar uh, in, in the British cop shows that I watch, there's a lot of that going on too. They have to be given, they have to be cautioned, right? So this guy wasn't cautioned by the, by the devil. Uh, here's another one where the, there's a patient apparently, and. Uh, and the, the doctor and uh, so, and an assistant of the doctor and the, the doctor seems to be saying, uh, in your case, Dave, there's a choice, elective surgery, uh, outpatient medicinal th uh, therapy or whatever's in the box that a lovely Carol is holding. So I take it as a case of power that the patient doesn't really have a, the, the doctor has all the power over the patient in this case. So pretty much the patient will be, will be giving consent to one of, one of the things or the other without regard to uh, what they might have done otherwise. So they, they are in a, under uh, an unequal sort of a situation. Okay, and finally, I think this is the only good case of consent here. So here's two sumo wrestlers and one of them is saying the full disclosure, I really need this hug. So this is, they are actually giving a consent to a hug. Um, so they, they are being pretty honest uh, in, in obtaining a hug. So whoever is speaking is being very honest in obtaining a hug. 
So when we pull this together, you know, we had these nine criteria that I promised. So we have um, uh, that I already described visibility, free will and truth, uh, capacity, cognition, attention, statutes, power and honesty. And really, you know, what I, what I can do is I can group them. I will not do this in this way. I can group them in the Habermas uh, uh, claim, uh, validity claims in uh, th three for each of them. And I can write it down like this. I can summarize it all into um, the nine criteria into these three, uh, these three claims. So given that, and I think I've gone about 20 minutes or so, um, maybe this is a time to, uh, if, if anybody has any questions or comments, this is a good, good point to stop. Okay, um, it, since you won't ask me questions, I will ask you questions then. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going back to the so for evaluation. I thought since we're talking about requirements, I look at the three uh, scenarios I'd introduced earlier. So this is the same picture we saw earlier. You know, does anyone fe else feel uh, like they're being washed? And what I did was I drew this sort of a spider web around it. So this is truth, sort of it's overwritten the little uh, truth, free will and visibility. Those are the three um, objective ones. Uh, capacity, cognition, and attention, those are the subjective ones, and statutes, power, and honesty, those are the practical ones. So if you imagine, so, you know, let's say outside is the is the worst violation, outside of the spider, so this is the inside is the good case, the outside is the worst violation. So what do you think this would be a violation of? So, you know, we, we thought that it wasn't a, a case of good consent, you know, because apparently this person never gave consent to the CIA, uh, you know, uh, watching them or whatever. So, which of the criteria or how would the criteria apply? I, I would say free will is in that case not respected. Okay. Uh, who, who spoke? Uh, me, Matthew. Matthew, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? I was thinking of honesty. I am mighty. Well, honesty would be if the CIA had told uh, that's my yeah, my so the CIA yes. would have told this guy like we are not going to watch you, but then they watched him. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like they never said they weren't going to watch him. And if he's posting on Facebook or whatever, uh, why would he even? Uh, why would he even think he wasn't being watched? Like, so he's posting on a public forum and then he's worried that somebody's reading his comments. Okay. Sorry, Mul Mulinda, yeah. I, I didn't really, this is Virginia. I didn't yeah. really understood the question. Do you want positive or negative examples of the- No, no, I, I, we, we have, the, uh, you know, I, I talked about these criteria. Yes. And we thought that this case was a case where mm -hmm. this guy did not really give, you know, he's he's, assume that this guy is uncomfortable with yeah. being washed by so let's say he in his mind he thinks he hasn't given consent so i'm thinking like what is it a violation of so matthew thought it's a violation of the free will criterion mm -hmm. uh, maita thinks it's a violation of the honesty criterion yeah. so I, I wouldn't say it's a violation but it's a definitely uh, um, implementation of the power criteria because seemingly the the CIA has uh, the power to uh, to participate in whatever uh, Twitter conversation that is going on or whatever uh, social mm -hmm. media this is. But in the way, the CIA so the CIA doesn't have any power over him. Like they are not forcing him to go post, you know, reveal his secrets to them. No, I, but it has the power to participate in all those uh, whatever yeah. conversations going on on social media. Yeah, so no the way, one... the way, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's interesting, yeah. interesting. Uh, so the way I had used the word power was that they would be, they are able to subjugate him. Whereas I think uh, to me, it seems like he never visibly gave consent, but he, he never believed that he was giving consent. Like he never, you know, this guy, the, he never wanted to give consent to the CIA. He didn't sort of act according to that. But he seems to be confused that he thinks that he's he's making a private comment which only Tony is seeing, but everybody else is seeing it, right? Yeah. So, so there seems to be an you know, so there's an incompleteness of sorts. Uh, any any other uh, comments? I, I can I can let me post the solution I had, and I've, I've actually forgotten <laughs> what I had finally done, but uh, I had thought that yeah, this one. So I thought. 
maybe I'll, I'll go through this. So the visibility was that the consent is observable. I think he didn't sort of formally, you know, so you signed up for Facebook. He didn't formally say, you know, everybody else can watch what's going on. He may not have realized. <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't like he knowingly, he posted out of his free will. So nobody's making him post on Facebook. But he may not be, he may not be, he's, there's a, some, some sort of a violation of truth in that his beliefs are incomplete. He thinks he's private, but it's not actually private. Uh, certainly his capacity is fine. His, his cognition seems to be wrong. And maybe he's not even, doesn't have good attention. Like he doesn't realize what he's doing, right? He just signed, he may have accepted the Facebook uh, click wrap a year ago or whatever, not paying attention. And now he's, he's, he's on the hook. And there may be some statutory guidance. And maybe this is what Virginia is saying that the CIA, you know, they may be, if, they are, if, if this, in the, like in CIA is not allowed to uh, observe people in the US, right? Uh, Everybody else can be uh, is is fair game, so maybe if this was an American guy, then that would be a violation, presumably, uh, from the CIA, or some sort of a statutory guy, you know, violation. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe the European law also has some protections like that. But you can see that you know, typically, uh, in a case like this, so the user is, it'll be more than one of those criterion uh, criteria involved, but to a different degree. Yeah. Then wouldn't that make it more complex to assess, Melinda, in terms of... It does indeed. I think that's why there are, you know, uh, obviously, you know, we, we haven't, uh, the people we are, who are in this meeting right now, we haven't sort of agree, you know, agreed on all the criteria and so on. But assuming, you know, we take those criteria as they are, there's an mm -hmm. argument that even within each criterion, there's some, you know, wiggle room, right? Like, how much do you think... Uh, somebody's doing something wrong. But if you wanted to build agents who were nice, let's say somehow, you know, perfectly ethical in whatever way, then we would have to make sure that the agents did not, uh, they, they made sure that they did not, uh, they told this guy, hey, you know, are you sure, you know, what you're posting is going to go to the CIA, right? And don't go, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't try to trick him into clicking, right? And accept because they'd be saying, you know, they don't want to, whereas I think many, many times commercially, we have a, a commercial providers have an interest in getting you to click through very quickly, right? Because they don't want you to dwell on the negative uh, possibilities. Let, let's, uh, let's keep uh, going. We, we can always come back for discussions further as this time, but let's look at one, the second case. So the lemonade case. So what would this, this be a violation of where they, it's free, but they sell your information. Truth, because they are not saying it. Is that the one who is telling it? They don't. They don't say nothing about what they are doing uh, for the getting free lemonade. Well, no, I think the kids are the kids are being honest that way. They are they are saying they will sell your information. I I I, I don't know. The, there is no no uh, no sign there that they will uh, give you lemonade for information. It's yeah, you're right. Yeah, they have or, not. Or man, one of yeah. them is uh, is observing that, but they they are not. Uh, if they were yeah. being truthful, there would be a sign there saying lemonade for uh, for information or whatever. Yeah, Instead that's a for twenty five cents. Yeah, 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 that's right. You could have said that you know free, free lemonade or something, and you know tell us your name or whatever. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I had not thought of that, but yeah, they should have the kids should have been more honest. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Uh, I think it's power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking more of power. Sorry, we'll let others speak. Pa power in what way? So they are not the kids are not subjugating you. Like you know, maybe if you're like desperate for if you're dying of thirst, maybe they are, but not otherwise. Mm. Right, so there's some contextual element, right? If it's really, you're dying of thirst and it's the only way to keep alive and then you know, you'll give them anything, right? So if you can so give I, your life at, uh, at fine, then also visibility is by that. Yes, yeah, so are you explicitly giving the, giving the consent? Is what Wahid is, ask, is pointing out. So I, I would say there is uh, probably uh, elements of uh, both cognition and attention, which like, so if you're really very thirsty, then mm -hmm. you might hear that it's free, but they sell your information, but the only thing that you see is that you want to drink. 
yeah yeah so yeah exactly that could also pay be the case to the rest. you you pay it yeah you will if you're sufficiently sufficiently desperate you would ignore the uh, part of the information that you have to yeah. decide on yeah and yeah. probably also don't know what it means that they sell your information so yeah, I guess sell your information. Yeah, I mean, I think I think people we, we can assume people know that, right? They're going to they're going to sell your information oh, to the, advertisers yeah. or. or the, no, you, people no? don't really know. If, yeah, yeah. If they say I sell. Uh, other people can see this information. You think, oh yeah, one or two, but you don't you you, you don't think that it will be a uh, uh, hundred companies that will sell it again to two thousand other ones and. Yeah, and yeah, indeed, or, or, the, or the purpose that it'll be used for. So they're not yeah. they're not making clear that this will be used for you know whether for just selling you yeah. more lemonade yeah. or will it be used for you know political manipulation? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I, these, I, are, these are good good uh, comments. I uh, I'll have to actually. I'm glad the talk is being recorded, or I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is it being later. recorded. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So. Yeah, I was, I had, when I thought about it, so I think I agreed with Frank on the attention part of it. There's some sort of a statutory thing going on, like he's going around selling information. I thought the kids, I, I so maybe I, I, I concede Virginia's point that the kids should have been more honest, but I thought they'd already sort of told this guy. So they were, you know, so maybe this this point could move out if the kids are being dishonest. The, but the kids don't have any like power over the, over the adults. Uh, the whoever given that then the then the other things sort of fall out and that the, the if they know these people know what's going on then there's no violation of visibility of free will you're going by free will to get your lemonade um but maybe you're maybe if you're thirsty you know part of your so it's the the damage seems to be more on the subjective front here that you know you're not paying attention you're not thinking through through about you know how far your information will go and your, maybe your capacity is diminished by your thirst, right? And you're in a in a rush to proceed. Okay. What about the Picasso case? I will say free will. This is my thing again. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, so in a way, she has not given consent to be uh, uh, to be looked at in this awkward way, right? So she, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But as far as so, these pertain to the cons the consenter. So there's nothing wrong with her ability. It's not like she accidentally gave consent or didn't pay attention. So I think these are all safe. There's no violation here. The violation seems to be. Uh, in sort of partly here and maybe, maybe partly there could be some statutory or you know power depends on what the power relationships are which are not obvious here but there could be some things uh, that come into play in that uh, that space uh, any other comments i actually now your comment uh, made me question because uh, you are uh, the way you describe it you look at the from the perspective of the one who is uh, giving uh, the consent and not from the perspective of the one who is uh, taking the consent so the, you are looking at it from the perspective of the the female cartoon and not the so i was yeah, yeah I, most I of these are with the consenter in this case and then the consentee is just the the honesty applies to the consent the the parties receiving I, the consent. The way I was, I hadn't uh, paid enough attention to the to that one. Yeah. But I think most of them you can take them from the perspective of the consenter and the consentee. Yeah, but I I think in the criteria like if you the uh, if you if you if the consenter gives consent uh, under under what or you know so what makes consent. Uh, sort of valid would be that the consenter had the right atten attention, the consenter thought through properly or had the mental capacity, the mm -hmm. consenter made a public sort of statement, uh, the consenter did it out of free will, uh, the consenter's beliefs were, you know, true at the time of doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, and then these are sort of more like the statutes that apply are, are sort of like the surrounding context. And then this, these two are that the consentee doesn't have power over the consenter. 
So like mm -hmm. sometimes you know you might be giving you might give consent to do something, but you are under power. You know the other party has power over you, so it's not yeah. really consent. Or, or the consentee uh, has lied. They told you something mm -hmm. and it's something else, right? So then that mm -hmm. would be also a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the subjective one, so the capacity, cognition, and yeah. attention, I think they can apply to the consentee as well. The consentee is not pay, paying attention whether or not it's is getting uh, given the consent. Also, maybe has not the capacity or the cognition to evaluate what it yeah, means yeah. to get consent. So I, I was looking at those. Uh, yeah. uh, they can be looked from both ways. Yeah, no, indeed. But I think I think the consent would still be valid. So it, it could be that the consentee has made a mistake, in which case there is no consent. Uh, I mean, the consentee could act as, you know, without any consent it, at all. It could have uh, understood that it got consent. Yeah, by, yeah but it did uh, not get consent. It didn't, it didn't got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that, that's that's yet another another dimension which I didn't bring, bring out here in the literature, they distinguish between um, culpability and blameworthiness. And you could say, Mm -hmm. They could be culpable in some cases, meaning that they had done something wrong, but you might not blame them because their beliefs were so they, like I, I could take your car and drive off thinking that you gave me consent. Yeah. In this case, I could be um, culpable, perhaps because that I stole your car, but I may not be morally blameworthy because mm -hmm. I thought you, you, know, you gave me the keys. Right. So yeah. that should be an example of uh, which is not being play, uh, played here. So we could we could certainly. Uh, add that to the uh, to the mix, but if I but I think the broader picture is that when you start thinking about consent and you know thinking about how to develop norms and you know realize responsible autonomy, there are many of these uh, many of these factors have to come into play, and they they run into norms and values and all of that that we've been studying in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, in our community for a long time, and things like statutes and so on. They refer to many of the organizational uh, constructs that we also talked about. Yeah. yeah, so I had, when in, in my thinking, I was giving it, uh, I, I thought there was nothing wrong with the woman sort of in this case. So there's no violation there. Like she hasn't done anything. She didn't make a mistake at all. Her, her beliefs could be wrong that, uh, you know, about, uh, about the other party. Uh, there was, she never said, uh, you know, uh, do, do X. So, you know, in, in a way there's no visibility. So the fact that he's doing it without the consent is, is quite clear. There's a statutory violation, probably. I would think there's no power differential, but there could be a small power differential uh, at play. You know, not knowing anything else. So you know, so uh, so my my my. The, I guess the the part of the model is that there are these there are these. Um, we're trying to understand consent broadly speaking. We can't just rely on the traditional mental versus communicative thing. We have to look at the social uh, action. And when you start looking at the social action, we get these criteria, and many of them touch upon. Cognition, many of them touch upon objective reality, many of them touch upon uh, statutory so, societal constraints, and I guess they all involve values at some, some level. Um, well, um, yeah, Minera, uh, yeah. especially in this case, uh, one thing that uh, I th at least uh, I, I wonder about is uh, the difference in uh, interpretation of a situation between the consenter and the consentee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I think Virginia has something similar in that it could be that yeah. the uh, the consentee has formed some erroneous views, and of course, in uh, a, a, many discussions pertaining to you know sexual sort of relations often involve that, yeah. right? There's some sort of a difference, but uh, but but I think I think the way it plays out is that so we we could certainly ask if the consenter was being uh, you know had an erroneous belief or not. So we're not. So it could be that they, the, no consent was given. So there was no legitimate consent. Uh, and the guy misbehaved in some ways, but he misbehaved out of, a, you know, like an honest mistake, sincere, you know, with sincere misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I, it's not, not, not being shown in this picture, but that could, be, that could be a thing to be considered. And that relies on this distinction between blame and blameworthiness and the culpability. Manindir, I think we are running out of time, uh, so okay. I think you can you can wrap up and then we'll have final set of questions. Maybe, okay, maybe a couple of questions. Yeah, so I, I uh, thank you, and I thought you know when we talk about consent, you know, we it leads us to new challenges. So we had to understand communication uh, at greater depth. We had to maybe think about how to bridge ethics and law. You know, duty and discretion sort of come into play in consent quite a lot. We had to think about uh, design methods such as you know how to accommodate values and 
the consentability in the system. Uh, maybe formal verification that takes us beyond the you know, trolley problem. So there's a lot of the, the single agent people are thinking about trolley problems a lot, and I want to move away from that <laughs> uh, if, if possible. Uh, and then talk about you know continual uh, adaptation, that making making our systems be smart so that they can figure out the boundaries of these consent and often carry out you know more interesting dialogues with users. And and that's it. Uh, I will stop here because I'm at yeah. the last page. Yeah. Th thank thank you, Marinda, for the interesting talk. So yeah, um, a round of applause. And Pablo's hand was first. So so Pablo, you you can have your first question. Thank you very much, Tony. Muninder, I was fascinated by your talk. And I was wondering if one of the purposes or the functions of a consent is legitimation of actions, why are the criteria for evaluation not more directly linked with values? As values being somehow, in a sense, one of the ways you can uh, validate or legitimate an action. So if you think of the criteria as values, then maybe the labels you have and the orientation of the value towards the two actors can give you a nice analytical way of uh, characterizing uh, consent and the criteria for making it applicable in the programming of behavior or in the regulation of behavior in order to guarantee consent. Am I making any sense? Yeah I, yeah, I think so. I think I think I generally agree with your thinking that you know uh, behind it there are there are values indeed. Like you know, for example, with the statutory criteria, there are also values. Like we might say that you know minors should not be asked to give consent, or people who are um, uh, up with capacity that people who are you know suffering from dementia can't be expected to give, give mm -hmm. consent, uh, or that in a in a hospital or whatever there's there's a power differential and the consent is not valid. So I think they're all all driven by values but these are the so may, maybe as a backdrop you can you can have another layer of structure behind this which tells you you know what are the values at play yes and that that might uh, not there are there are indeed cases where people are sort of sort of quasi coerced into giving consent you know like many uh, i think it still goes on in parts of india uh, i think where there are you know young people uh, you know often young girls are uh, got are married off and they would be they would get them to say uh, you know give the consent but not give them a whole lot of choice about giving the consent right so it'd be sort of in a so we could say well yeah that seems like a power sort of a situation uh, coming into play and it seems wrong to us because we don't share the you know the values of those uh, uh, of those communities mm. yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so so virginia your question this will be the last question for the session uh, so my, my question is also a bit a reaction on the question of uh, uh, Pablo. Uh, the issue of consent, I, I relate it very much to an uh, issue of uh, legal, uh, legal uh, um, formal approach to, to, uh, to agree between the, the, the two, two parties. And if we are then going to, to link it to values, uh, I think that it needs to have um, a legal interpretation of the values. And I'm saying this based on a, a, a situation that happened during the discussions at UNESCO on defining the, the recommendations of UNESCO for AI systems, which I was part, part of. And there was a clear movement from some countries, especially those least democratic countries, in which they want to make all reference to uh, human rights being being replaced from, to reference to ethics, being that ethics or values are subjective and each country or each culture or each, um, each person can uh, argue that you have your own values and the values and ethics are kind of personal, whereas uh, 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 human rights are uh, uh, based on uh, legal agreements. So if we are going to link consent to um, values, I would think that that would need to be a bit more uh, uh, organized around a legal uh, framework. Yeah, I think I think yes, what's yes. interesting with consent is that it it ties together the the legal and the and the moral, right? So so this is the yeah. so there's the moral legitimacy part of it, and then there's the legal legitimacy part of it. Yeah. Now, in the in in current sort of legal uh, approaches, you know, they call the legal positive uh, positivist approaches. So what they what they really mean is the law is what it is. It's it's not meant to be 
uh, ethically sound. It's just it's just no. stuff you have to do. Uh, but then there are the traditional laws, which are uh, the traditional legal frameworks are usually usually based on religion. They would say, well, law happens out of divine right, and it's sort of moral because you know you're, uh, you know, God told you to be a certain way. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think with ethics, you have this opportunity to try to reconcile these notions. So we still want to stay with now, uh, not in a religion driven society necessarily, but we still want to have, you know, the moral as component of, uh, of uh, 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 the moral components of, of a community's uh, values sort of brought to bear along with the legal uh, standards. So I, I, th I think the two have to be tied together and I leave it as a uh, as one of the future directions, but I don't have a I don't have a clear answer. But maybe we should we should talk about it more offline if you if you would like. Sure, I would be happy to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank thank you very much, um, Munin, there for your very interesting and stimulating talk. I think I think there will be a lot of um, conversation around uh, what you discussed today because one of the questions that come to my mind is now how do we move forward? Yes, you have de you have defined these characteristics. Um, you know, how do we now operationalize it, which is actually the, the, the next step. I'm, I'm sure you will also be thinking along, along those lines. So thank, thank you uh, very much for the, for the talk. And uh, please join me in thanking um, Munindir for this excellent talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. So now we move on to um, the two papers um, for this session. Um, so the uh, first paper um, is the complexity of norm synthesis and revision by um, Davide Della Anna, Natasha Alcina, Fabiano Del Pies, Mehdi Dastani, Martin Lofer, and Brian Logan. And Natasha will be presenting this paper. Okay, I'll so, just. Uh... Yeah, sure. Oh. I lost the share. Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, inviting, well, uh, 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 accepting the paper. And I'm afraid it's um, uh, completely devoid of nice cartoons, unlike Moninder's talk. So um, what's the um, uh, topic of the paper is, is uh, how to come up with uh, nice uh, norms, um, uh, which would ensure that uh, bad things don't happen in a multi-agent system. So more specifically, suppose we have a set of traces, uh, behaviors of a multi-agent system, and we can tell which ones are all right and which are not. And this classification is according to some outside objective uh, of the system. For example, if the uh, set of behaviors are uh, behaviors of cars on the motorway, the objective could be something very global, um, such as um, we would like to reduce emissions or we would like to prevent car crashes. So the task uh, of uh, this work is to synthesize a conditional norm uh, such that um, uh, if uh, we accept this norm, uh, the norm just indeed exactly coincides with the objective, the good traces um, obey the norm and the bad traces violate it. Um, and the norm is in the language which is kind of understandable and forcible, uh, controllable uh, by the agents. So it's not about avoid collisions, it's about the speed limits, for example. It's a property that uh, agents uh, are in control. of. And if the norm is obeyed, only good traces will occur in the future. So that's the general idea. And it's, um, uh, in big part uh, work of David Adelana uh, in his uh, PhD. Um, partly it's about norms, partly it's about requirements. Uh, so these two things are kind of interacting a bit. Um, so the norms we looked at are um, conditional norms with deadlines. 
and um, they've been around uh, for a while. And uh, they uh, are a tuple, which consists of a condition formula, a prohibition or obligation formula, depending on what the norm is, uh, whether it's prohibition or an obligation, and a deadline. And the idea is that um, once the condition becomes true, then later on the stretch, um, until the deadline becomes true, either something is prohibited, uh, the some condition shouldn't occur, or uh, something should happen. So in one of the states, the obligation formula should become true. And um, um, the conditional norm formally, um, these formulas are in some propositional language. Um, and um, the language, as I explained before, is something which the agents can understand, observe, and control. So uh, some technicalities, um, uh, a trace of behavior is a sequence of states, finite sequence of states. Um, a state is um, basically a propositional assignment. Um, this propositional language L um, is finite and uh, we just uh, say for each propositional variable there what it's true or false in a state. And um, the set of all states is obviously also finite um, because there are finitely many different um, uh, state descriptions. And um, uh, this set gamma is just a finite set of sequences of those states. And um, each subset of set, uh, states is definable simply by this junction of state descriptions. So um, uh, more precisely, what are the truth conditions, kind of a violation conditions of um, conditional prohibition? We have uh, phi uh, C, which is when the norm becomes active. Then we have some prohibition formula, phi P, and then there is a deadline. So the norm is violated on a trace like this, uh, consisting of four states. If, for example, there is the condition uh, true in state S0, so the norm becomes active. Uh, in S1, nothing happens, but in S3, uh, prohibited property happens, and it happens before the deadline becomes true. And on this state, it doesn't become true at all, or uh, it would still be a prohibition if the deadline became true in the last state. So that's what um, is written in um, symbols. Um, there is um, uh, norm is active on this trace, otherwise it can't be violated, and prohib prohibited condition happens before the deadline condition happens. So um, again, as I said, uh, this set of traces is partitioned into two sets, um, the ones that we want to keep uh, and the ones um, which we want to um, make um, violations of the norm. And this partition is done with respect to some uh, sort of very um, abstract and global uh, objective. So the problem that we are interested in, one of them is um, how to synthesize a conditional prohibition given um, this set of traces. So um, we have finite gamma partitioned into good and bad traces. And can we find uh, three formulas uh, such that um, uh, they constitute condition, prohibition, and deadline? And every bad trace violates this norm, and every good trace uh, doesn't. So, um, and we show uh, that the prohibition synthesis problem is NP complete. The membership in NP is very simple. Um, we just um, guess the formulas and um, we can do it in um, polynomial time and check whether indeed um, the corresponding norm is 
uh, violate the null negative traces. Uh, we can do it in linear time. And uh, whether um, it's not violated on any of the positive traces, that we can also do it in linear time. And then p-hardness is proved by reduction from uh, satisfiability problem for clauses with um, at most three um, literals. So um, the kind of synthesis um, uh, problems uh, we've been working on lately um, are usually starting from double exponential and going up. Um, but in this case, um, NP-complete is actually quite bad news. And I'll mention in the future work that David actually wanted to do approximation of norms and do it in polynomial time. Um, and this was a kind of motivation for doing this work, that you can't do it in polynomial time precisely. So similarly for obligations, a conditional obligation is violated on a trace if, again, the norm is active, so condition is true somewhere. In some later state, uh, the deadline is true. Uh, and nowhere between these two uh, states um, is the state which uh, satisfies the obligation formula. So, for example, uh, uh, once you borrow a book, then before the deadline, you obliged to return it. Um, and um, obligation is violated if this um, action of returning doesn't happen. And again, the obligation synthesis problem is very similar. Um, we are asked if there are three propositional formulas so that the corresponding obligation would classify the traces correctly. And the shape of this uh, problem is very similar to prohibition. And the same uh, idea of uh, hardness proof also works for obligations. So uh, this problem is also NP-complete. So um, another problem we looked at uh, is sometimes you cannot classify. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you cannot classify the set of traces by a single norm. Um, can you classify it by a finite set of norms? And the answer is uh, yes, and the complexity is not any harder. Um, so, um, and final problem that we looked at is minimal norm revision, which is um, uh, how to modify the existing norm, which doesn't quite work in such a way that it changes as little as possible. So um, the agents are kind of used to it, um, but at the same time, it begins to classify the traces correctly. So, um, the result again holds without any particular assumption on how we measure the editing distance. Um, and the decision theoretic form of the problem is, is the norm with an editing distance less or equal than M that correctly classifies the traces. And this problem is also NP-complete. So um, as I said, um, this um, was considered in uh, the work David was doing um, two um, uh, onerous uh, task. I mean, the uh, exponential sort of procedure in the worst case. Uh, so the future work, uh, which he already done quite a lot on, uh, is approximation of norms and synthesizing tractable, uh, synthesizing norms in a tractable way. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. And. Um, I think I can stop sharing if I can find. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's thank the speaker. So thank, thank you, Natasha. Um, so are there are there questions? Okay. If there are no questions, um, I'll use the opportunity to yes. ask my questions. Oh, there is. Is there is there a question? Okay. I'll I'll go ahead with my question anyway. Um, so Natasha, Pablo um, had a question, uh, Tony. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Uh, Pablo, Pablo, you go first. Quick one. Natasha, hello. Great talk. Well, uh, in practice, many times you have a system in which you want to put certain norms, 
but uh, you want them to be expressed in a way that the users themselves specify the norms or can interpret the formalization of that norm. That sometimes forces you to have a very restricted language for expressing the norms. Would that uh, possibility of restricting the, the language that is used to express the norm uh, facilitate the complexity of, these, of the type of operation that you were looking into? Uh, that is, can you choose a, a restricted type of norms in which uh, time or uh, post conditions are limited in a substantial way so that you can have a practical set of, of norms? Um, I'm not totally sure, but I think uh, it's slightly orthogonal directions. Um, uh, the, we don't uh, make very strong assumptions on what the conditional norms are. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the reduction works when we basically would have sort of colors of states, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's all still um, be hard. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's quite a simple idea, sort of like when this happens, you have to do this or you should do this until mm -hmm. something else happens. So it's, it's pretty okay. simple, straightforward um, format mm -hmm. uh, of the norms, but um, the complexity is um, mm -hmm. in certain sort of uh, traditional way hard. Um, um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, We'll thank, take it thank, over. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for the question, Pablo. Um, so the, the next question will come from Sohail. Sohail, um, you, you can uh, ask the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for your presentation. My question is regarding the temporal aspects of your norm. You said you, you, you represented norms with a deadline. I am curious how you represent that uh, deadline uh, in your model. Thank you. What did you use? Um, it's a kind of descriptive deadline. It's another propositional formula. It just says until this thing happens, until the bell rings. Um, uh, so it's not deadline in terms of time. Um, and I guess um, we could probably do some kind of counting from the start to the deadline. Um, and I don't think it would help with complexity, but I don't think it would make it worse uh, because everything is finite and um, the sort of the, the, the longest number of steps you have to count is also finite. So I think we could probably replace um, our sort of declarative description of the deadline with some kind of LTL next state um, operator or some metrical form, uh, formula, LTL metric formula. So um, conditional norms are a very small subset of LTL. Um, so I guess if we did introduce counting deadlines uh, till um, uh, some number of steps, uh, it would be fine. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't change the complexity. All right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, Natasha. Let's let's thank the speaker um, for the interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. So I will I will actually um, send my questions to you, Natasha, because we've run out of time. Yeah. Thank you. So um, the last speaker for um, the last paper for this session um, is. Um, centralized norm enforcement in mixed motor multi-agent reinforcement learning by Rafael Molinari Chang, Ana Rosa Alves Franco Brando, and um, um, Amy Sickman. Um, so, and the and the speaker would be Rafael. So, Rafael, over to you. Yep. Okay. So you can you can see my my screen, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. We can see it. Uh, okay, so I'll start. Um, so the title of our project is uh, Centralized Norm Enforcement and Mixed Motive Multi-Agent Enforcement Learning. Uh, I'm Rafael, uh, I co-authored this together with uh, Professor Ana Rosa and Professor Jaime uh, here from University of Sao Paulo. Uh, sorry. And the problem we're, we're actually interested in is this one, is the collective action problem. I think others have touched on this before a little, 
but this problem happens when you have a group of people with, with a common interest. Uh, but the individuals that makes up the group, uh, uh, they have conflicting interests to those of the group. So what ends up happening is that uh, since the group is able to actually uh, achieve or not its goals uh, uh, based on the, the combined actions of all individuals, then it's very hard for the group to actually achieve these goals. Um, so this problem has been addressed uh, in, in multi-agent enforcement learning uh, in two major ways before. Uh, the first one, by assuming that agents uh, are prosocial and they will act in accordance with the group's interest. And the second one, by letting agents punish each other whenever they identify a defective behavior. Uh, but these two assumptions, they, these two, they, they assume something about the agent, right? So uh, the, first, the first one assumes that the agent uh, will act in a certain way, uh, so they'll be prosocial. And the second one assumes that the agents are actually able to punish each other. Uh, and we argue that this uh, is not always the case. So what we do then uh, when, these are, when none of these assumptions are valid? Uh, and we can think of a system uh, where this might be the case, right? Uh, so regarding, uh, so, so the system uh, is the, the, as an example, uh, it's the, the a system, you can think of a system of uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, so regarding the first point, which is that the agents will be per social, uh, maybe the, the designers uh, who build the agents, uh, they don't have the right incentives to build this per social agent since the system itself is embedded uh, in a competitive environment. And uh, regarding the second point, uh, which is that the agents are able to punish each other, uh, it's not very clear how this could be achieved in, in, in the system uh, without really compromising the safety of the passengers uh, of the cars. So it's really hard to, to come up with a way that the agents could actually uh, punish each other. Uh, so we identified this need for, for solving the, the collective action problem uh, in multi-agent reinforcement learning environments. Uh, when first we have no prior knowledge about the agents, uh, and second, when uh, we don't want the agents to actually uh, punish each other. And I'll just talk about our proposal. I don't, don't have much time allocated to me. Uh, so uh, our idea here is just to build on top of existing uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning environments. Uh, and we, we, the plan is to just enhance them with these normative concepts. Uh, here, uh, which are, uh, are encoded within this, uh, the ethical five uh, variables here. Uh, so this is taken from the, the ethical grammar of institutions uh, proposed by Crawford and Lowstrom. Uh, and you can think of this just as the norms of the system. It's just a way uh, to operation, operationalize the norms. Uh, and you also, uh, we also propose adding a regulator uh, to the system uh, so, to, uh, so, so this uh, regulator is also a reinforcement learning agent, uh, and uh, his job will be to, to actually um, propose these norms of the system, and by doing so, to change the incentives of these agents here. So uh, a, a basic step on this, on this cycle here works as follows. Uh, the regulator would, uh, will set the norm of the environment, and then for a pretty fine, no, pretty fine number of time steps, then the agents will act on this environment, uh, change the, the environment state and receive a reward. And by doing that, uh, they can actually update their policies so they, they can optimize uh, by uh, acting on this environment. Uh, and after this uh, pretty fine number of time steps, then uh, the regulator is able to sense the state of the environment uh, through a system diagnostic. So he's able to, to sense how, how healthy the, the, the environment uh, is uh, and is also able to to uh, he also receives a reward uh, which is based on the social outcome of these uh, agents uh, and the regulator can then use this information to update uh, its own policy uh, and become better at picking uh, at setting the norms of the, this environment. Uh, so so we tested this uh, on an experiment. Uh, the experiment we tested was uh, was uh, simulated the tragedy of the Commons game. Uh, that's the case with the, the, the shared resources. Uh, so we've created this environment with uh, a, a finite quantity of uh, shared resource, and we populated the five reinforcement learning agents. Uh, and the idea is that if the agents, they consume as much as they can, which is the, uh, their incentive, uh, then the resource uh, of this environment would just deplete and they'll have nothing else to consume. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if they manage to consume sustainably, then 
the the resource will replenish itself and then the agents will be able to consume uh, for, a long, for a longer period. Uh, and in this settings, when we, we just added this regulator uh, uh, who's able to set the allowances, so uh, the consumption limit for these agents and also the sanctions. So what happens to the agents when uh, they, they exceed this limit? And these are our prelim preliminary, preliminary results. Uh, so this graph here shows uh, uh, the, run, the uh, two runs we 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 done uh, uh, on this uh, environment. Uh, the y-axis here uh, it shows the total consumption. So so that's the idea of this social outcome uh, for each episode uh, of the simulation. Uh, the orange line here shows uh, uh, a simulation we done without any regulator, and we can see that. Uh, when we had no regulator in place, then if we just leave to self-interest agents to, to, to learn uh, how to best behave in this environment, they just learn to quickly uh, consume as much as they can. Uh, and that's it. Uh, but then when we added the regulator, uh, the story is a bit different. So in the beginning of the simulation, the, the agents, they, they learn to consume as much as they can. Uh, but afterwards, after a short period, then uh, the regulator increasingly learns to just to adjust the norms. Uh, and by, by adjusting the norms, he, he changes the individual incentives of the other agents. And he managed to promote this sustainable consumption. And that's what, what we see in this uh, blue line here. Uh, that's what I had planned for today. Uh, I just want to thank Ito, uh, Ito Bank for supporting this research uh, through a scholarship. And if you have any questions, you uh, you can ask me now or you can send me, uh, reach me uh, through my email. Okay, let's, let's thank the speaker before we take questions. So now questions. So as others are thinking about the question, okay, Pablo has a question. So thank you, Pablo. Over to you. I don't want to be a pest. <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 this is perfect. <laughs> Rafael, could you explain why do you have this blue erratic behavior at the end of the graph? What did that meant? It seemed like you were having a more variance in the, in the, in yes. the, in the behavior. Oh, why do you have the, that, that uh, dips in the and the amplitude changing? Oh, this is just common like uh, reinforcement learning training. So this, this is what I'm depicting here. It's just the, uh, the training of these reinforcement learning agents and, and these agents, they, uh, it might be for just the initiation of uh, the environment or uh, just uh, uh, exploration of these agents. But it seems uh, to increase. Just, just to say that I, I'm, not very, I'm not really sure exactly why this happens. Uh, but that's what I would uh, suppose. It would seem as if it, they, they were becoming detrained. They don't behave as they seem, to, the regulator or the agent seem to be changing their behavior. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, I, I think it might be just, uh, just because of maybe the initiation, because mm -hmm. there's some uh, stochastic, some randomness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also just, maybe exploration okay. um, in the beginning of the, the, the each simulation. Okay. So I, I, I did wonder, following up on Pablo's question, did he explore um, the, by changing the ratio of exploration to exploitation? Um, so do they... So how you know, how long you set up for exploration and then no, follow we just, we're, we're not we're not we're not yeah we're not setting exploration exclusively here uh we're using just just a regular uh, hoc architecture right right so, so we're not explicitly setting yeah so, so that's, okay right it, it might it might be interesting to experiment with, yep. with those setups that's one another question i had was a uh, um um, just a cheeky question. I want. I, I yeah. thought, why did you choose centralized norm enforcement? You know, why did you not go for a distributed um, setup for for your your solution? Uh, 
just, I mean, because we had those two, uh, let's say we had those two constraints in mind, which were uh, uh, those two assumptions uh, made that, uh, let's say agents are not able to, to actually do anything in, in a sort of way. So it was hard to come up with a distributed solution. Uh, that's what basically we came up with uh, for, for this problem specifically. Um, so is, that's, just, that's the only reason, uh, honestly. Um, it's just right. that for, yeah. for those two constraints we had, uh, I, we, feel, we felt like this uh, was, uh, the, let's say, the, the easiest way to, to, to do it. OK, yeah, yeah. So, so th thank you, Rafael. Are, are there more questions? So I don't see um, anyone putting their hand up. So, so, so thank you very much, Rafael, for your presentation. So let's thank the speaker again. <clears throat> so that's the end of um, the second session. Um, I know we are, we are running late um, by more than um, 15, 15 minutes. Is, the, is that right, Nero? Um, yes, I think we are running late. Uh by 12 13, 13 12, 12 13 minutes but i think it'll be good to have a short break and, and resume maybe the break should be just five minutes um sounds good yeah sounds good okay so when, when we come back we will we'll start the third session so we'll start the third session in five minutes time so let's go and have a stretch or get a drink uh, we've been sitting quite long The speakers of third session, if they're here, they, they want to try screen sharing. Okay. Um, the for, for the first paper, let's try to share my screen. Yeah, that works fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anyone else from one of the raffle? Uh, one, one, one more point, uh, 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 because uh, we will be uh, presenting together, me and Jonathan. Okay. I will, I will, pre I will be presenting the, the presentation, but Jonathan will speak, and then then uh, switch switch to me, and, was, and the rest of the rest of the presentation will be connected by me. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. That's for your knowledge. Thank you. Uh, Asimina, maybe for the third paper. Yes, sure. I can yeah. try that. So, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead and try. Um, make sure we can forward. Can you see? Yeah, we can see it. Thanks. Amazing. Yeah, that works. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Isting, Isting, do you want to give it a try as well? Uh, what about, okay. What about Peter? Yeah, we can see that, thank you. So I just realized you are talking to me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I probably didn't say it right. All right. So can I try now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Can I see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. That's Thank good. you. Yeah, worries. And Sri Ashalia. Or maybe someone else is presenting. Stephen, maybe? Rafael, maybe you can try to show the, the slides. Uh, 
Rafael Kunha, are you there? You can go ahead and try to share your screen. I am the, the co-author of Rafael. I'll try to find a copy of these slides and test from, from my side, just a minute. Okay. And we're getting ready to start as well. So we'll give you maybe a minute to do Hello. that. Hello, yeah. sorry. Uh, did you uh, uh, talk me? Yeah, I was hoping you could try to share your slides. Ah, okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. All right, good morning, day, night to everyone. Uh, welcome to the final session of COIN 2022. I've been enjoying it so far. I hope that you guys have as well. I know it's been quite a few hours and I'm really hoping that you are still ready to engage and be a part of the remaining six presentations. I'm pretty sure that they're gonna be very good. So we're gonna start off right away and we'll start with the first paper, which is Designing International Humanitarian Law into Military Autonomous Devices. And the authors are Jonathan Quick, Thomas Zurich and Tom Van Engers. And I'll hand over to you guys to go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Always a bit confusing. Um, thank you very much for the organizers uh, for this opportunity to uh, for us to, pre to present uh, our project, uh, which we've uh, written uh, amongst us three. So myself, uh, Jonathan Quick, uh, Thomas Zurek, and Tom van Engers. I will be uh, giving a brief uh, introduction first about the background of our project and uh, the more legal aspects of it, how we based uh, our framework on the legal rules. And afterwards, my colleague, uh, Thomas, will go more into the computational aspects. Next slide, please. Okay, so the backdrop of our paper basically is uh, the rise in popularity of AI for military applications. And uh, we've seen obviously now with the conflict in Ukraine, for example, how much of a force multiplier uh, these modern technologies are, in particular AI for targeting, because it makes the weapon that much more precise. But of course, as with many things with uh, developments in technology, there's always some blowback and there's always some, uh, some concerns uh, and for AI in the military domain, there's been a lot of concerns from a, diff a bunch of different domains, uh, ethics domain, for example, from human rights law. Uh, we've chosen to focus specifically on uh, the law of military, uh, military operations or IHL, international humanitarian law. And our main question is, uh, can such weapons be programmed in accordance with this applicable law. And this is a question that has arisen many, many times in different policy and different legal debates. And particularly during these debates, there's been particular contentions of the ability to, to distinguish uh, the ability to perform certain tests which are required by uh, IHLs, for example, the proportionality tests. So for our paper, we had two main goals. The first is to demonstrate in a hypothetical uh, framework how all of these required legal tests can be incorporated into such a hypothetical system. And the second one, which is also quite important, is to maintain operational uh, realism. This is a common trap uh, which uh, many of these uh, discussions fall into, that they only focus on the computational aspect and the legal aspect without really taking, in in taking into consideration how such systems would have to apply in practice. So for our project, we also took uh, the perspective of the actual military officer. So any such system must conform to military practice in the field, because otherwise you may have a good system which is legally compliant, but no military wants to use. And for this reason, we've primarily uh, used the framework of targeting. And targeting is what actual military officers use. It's a cyclical process which they use to determine how to attack and uh, how to attack targets, how to identify targets. Uh, and the good thing is, is that 
in IHL, all of these, uh, in targeting, all of these legal tests are already pre-installed. So that's why it was a good foundation uh, for our system. Next slide, please. So what we specifically did is, of course, first, the most important thing is we actually analyzed uh, very carefully this military targeting cycle, how it's actually done in practice. And this involved identifying the legal tests themselves, because if you want to demonstrate, so you want to prove that all of the legal tests are indeed satisfied by this system, you have to know what the legal tests actually are. Also important is the input variables, which are required for each test. And here we identify two in particular, which are quite important. First is MA, or military advantage. And the other one is IH, or incidental harm. There are a few other variables, but these are the most important ones. Also important is the timing. So for example, in the picture you see uh, down there, this is how uh, the targeting test actually applied in the field. This is from a military journal. So we took these into consideration so our system is actually able, able to be able to, uh, to be applied in the field. And finally, how these variables influence each other. So for example, a prior test may have an output which is relevant for a later test. So these must also be identified. And then we formulated the illegal tests which we have identified semi-formally. So this was the first step. Next slide, please. So this is an example of uh, one formalization of uh, Article 57.3 precautions. That's how we call it. So, for example, in this in this rule, very shortly, it's basically if you have if you have two targets which produce the same or uh, comparatively the same military advantage, you have to choose the one which has lower IH. So here we uh, formalize it as if exists dx and for every uh, dy in d, so d here is a decision, so the many options that are available, such that ma, which is military advantage x, is approximately similar to ma y, and I, I, ih of x is lower than I, ih of y, then you have to pick dx. So this is how we translated the legal rule into a more semi-formal form. And uh, in the graph below you see is how we basically identified all of these legal rules in a chronological sequence. So what we see here is six steps from goal analysis up to assessment. The, uh, the orange uh, blocks are the legal tests which the system should apply. So we have to demonstrate that the system does apply these. Um, and the blocks in uh, purple are the inputs. So for example, intelligence, collateral damage estimation, the actual military goals, these are all inputs that are necessary for the system uh, to be able to perform these tests. So based on this, then we started to construct our, uh, our computational framework, which will be explained by my colleague, uh, Tomas. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to present you some 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 technical details of our system. Uh, but firstly, just before I, I, I go to the to the to the to the structure of the system, I am introduce some 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 basics which are basic of our of our of our model. The, the, the first point uh, on which I'm going to focus is that is the um, uh, point that we are not going to create any any particular. Uh, targeting system. I don't mean for for and we don't aim to to create you know an, an autonomous drone or anything like that. We rather uh, aim at at uh, creating a, a general framework which allows which allows for which allows for creating such a system. And the second important point uh, are the requirements of transparency and explainability. It's, it's also our observation that uh, 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 international law, international law, humanitarian law. Mm, uh, uh, give a very strict requirements concerning uh, transparency and explainability, but those requirements are mainly focused on the process of 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 of, uh, of legal testing of those legal tests. Uh, my colleague mentioned before, and the and, and the and the process of decision making. But there's a, a behind the, behind those those two 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 processes. Uh, there is there's there are, there's a number of let's say cognitive functions. Uh, which are mainly focused on on, on, on the recognizing of, 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 of objects, of uh, recognizing of, 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 of the possibilities of decisions, uh, uh, predicting their, their results, and evaluating those decisions, which are uh, for which uh, international humanitarian law does not uh, impose any such strict uh, requirements concerning explainability. Uh, 
That's why uh, in our in our uh, uh, model we assume that model will be hybrid uh, and compasses uh, knowledge base. It's partially, partially, partially it will be uh, built on the basis of knowledge based paradigm, but also uh, especially that the, the, the cognitive function, uh, functions will be realized with the with the uh, knowledge uh, uh, based paradigm, but also data driven paradigm. For example, uh, machine learning based uh, uh, mechanisms. And the key element of our, of our work is the balancing between military advantage and incidental harm. And in order to represent those two, those two, let's say, concepts, uh, uh, we use uh, we use values, we treat them as values. Uh, there is a number of, of models of reasoning with values uh, created in the in, in the past. Uh, in our model, we are using you uh, understand values as an um, abstract concept, uh, uh, which allows us for estimation of, of a action, situation, state of affairs. Uh, and uh, what is important in our model, values can be uh, satisfied to a certain level, to a certain level. Uh, such, a, such an approach to values, such a model, so, such, a, such a concept of values is, 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 is different than it is in, in many approaches to value-based reasoning, because most of the approaches we know, values are usually has a, usually has a binary character, they're promoted or not. In our model, we, we assume that values can be promoted to a certain level, which is from the, uh, very important from the point of view of comparison between and balancing between military advantage and incidental harm. Uh, okay, uh, some 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 basic concept we are using in our in our uh, in our model. Uh, in goal, we are presenting. Our okay, in our model, we present goal as a minimal level of satisfaction of value of military advantage. Uh, which means that uh, that we we're not imposing in our system uh, uh, a particular set of affairs to be uh, to be achieved, but rather, but rather the level or the level of representation of value military advantage. Maybe I'll skip the the some some elements. We have we also introduced a, a formalization of of, of those uh, of those uh, legal rules. But now I present the structure of our system. What is important here is that we are uh, distinguishing distinguishing a cognitive part, which represents those uh, 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 um, cognitive functions, for example, uh, extraction of evaluated decisions or prediction of results and evaluation module, which is very important, in which in this evaluation model, we uh, 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 we are going to, to um, create a system which can, uh, which can uh, evaluate a particular results or a particular decision in the light of military advantage and incidental harm. And then those results of, the, of this model, along with, uh, with the probabilities, uh, of the predicted predicted results will be the basis of the tests will be uh, which are which are uh, 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 be performed in the in the in the reasoning part, and then those tests will get to uh, the results of those tests will be gathered together, and there will be uh, we will create a, a list of ordered list of decisions for the for the military advice. Uh, in our model, uh, what's interesting we. we introduce also a, a concept of a system, how to create a, a, a mechanism of, of uh, evaluating uh, of, uh, of decisions in the light of values. We're going to use with a, uh, 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 with a, we're going to use with a machine learning mechanism on the basis of annotated uh, uh, predicted results. Uh, 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 and then we are going to train a, a regression function on the basis of which uh, 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 such a system uh, can evaluate, it can evaluate uh, uh, a, a decision and, and the decision predicted and the results of the predicted uh, of, of the decisions, predicted result of the decision. Uh, okay, and, and in our paper we, we introduce a framework for creating a based hybrid targeting system. Uh, uh, we, dis we discuss the main stages of the of targeting process. And also, we introduced a mechanism which allows for development of, of, of development of such a system, and and a system which uh, evaluates for fulfilling requirements, IHL requirements. In our future, we are, we are going to, to develop the, the reasoning models and, and experiment uh, some create some make some experiments concerning uh, uh, the use of reasoning engines, as well as uh, prepare the analysis of possibility of evaluation of the of the results in the light of the relevant values and and the verification of the model the verification part what's, what's uh, uh, you know, the verification of our model uh, uh, can be, should be divided into two parts cognitive part 
should be uh, evaluated in the light of statistical uh, 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 performance of the of the of the uh, 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 of the mechanisms, while the reasoning part should be evaluated in the light of formal correctness and and uh, and and some experiments concerning reasoning mechanism. That's all. Thank you very much. And uh, we are looking for for the for the questions. Thank you very much. Maite, over to you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I was curious, I, I understand that you are presenting a general framework, but I was curious um, the way that uh, incidental harm is being evaluated or predicted. Uh, to me, it's kind of very open, I mean, it's kind of very difficult uh, to, to evaluate. Uh, do you have any insights of how this can be done? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that one of the slides I presented, of, of course, I presented very briefly. Uh, the, the main idea is that, uh, of course, such system is not created, you know, to to to, to predict for all all real life possibilities. Usually, such systems are, are are has a very narrow narrow scope. For example, you know, drones, which are for, for example recognize flying objects as a as a as a as a as a enemy object or or, or or civilian object or something like that. In our in our model, we 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 uh, plan to do it in a such a way that we. Um, Take a, a predicted, a, a predicted a number of predicted results of 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 of, of, of possible of, of, of possible results of situations of of of, of, of uh, targets and 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 military situation on the, on the battlefield, and then uh, with the human annotators, uh, we can uh, evaluate those uh, those those situations in the light of, of for example incidental harm. If there's a strong incidental harm or weak incidental harm, the levels of incidental harm. For such a particular situation, and then uh, we can train the regression mechanism, which can recognize on the basis of of predicted results uh, how to how how such a mechanism uh, how uh, let's say how mm, 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 to which level uh, a particular decision uh, 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 with such a predicted results will promote or or, or will satisfy value incidental harm. Of course, it's 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 uh, uh, it's a very general idea. Now we now we are preparing for for the experiments uh, uh, first with the with the let's say uh, uh, artificial created data in order to test to to to, to create a, a proof test or proof of concept test if it will be if it will be possible. Now now we are preparing to such experiments. I'd also like to add something. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, for incidental harm, it's actually not that complicated. And in some situations, you can actually provide incidental harm in empiric terms. That's actually already been done right now, even uh, without AI, when commanders are taking decisions in their, uh, in their war rooms. Um, you already have incidental harm predictors or collateral damage estimation methodology, which is already being used which uh, you can derive, for example, from how large the blast radius is, from the accuracy of the weapon itself, how accurate it is, what is the probability that it will hit a specific target. And from there, usually what they do is they take the averages, and from there you can kind of predict how much incidental harm will it shoot. So for, for these kind of situations, especially if you're still using more legacy systems, like rockets or, or bombs. And there's already uh, quite uh, an empiric database of how accurate the attack will be and how much harm will ensue. So that's one of the inputs which are actually easier to, to provide for our system. Thank you. Is there any other questions? So I was quickly thinking, um, so is this framework intended to be a decision support system or is it ultimately going to be a decision maker? Because my mind immediately went to like who or what is going to be ultimately responsible for those decisions if, if it's going to be a decision maker. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, in fact, our, this system could be uh, uh, implemented as, as both uh, function in, in, in both in both situation. However, however, I think that that uh, it, 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 the problem of responsibility, Jonathan, as a lawyer, probably has has is much more much more confident in such in such a in such an answer. 
This is quite a tough question, which I, I, <laughs> unfortunately I probably can't explain it all here. But um, in in our paper, we uh, make we make clear that uh, our system was actually made. We we actually don't specify if this is going to be a decision assistant or a decision maker, because what we wanted to do is we wanted to prove that all of these legal tests, which are obligatory from a legal perspective, can theoretically be made. But in practice, we're not saying that the same system should make all of these decisions. So when we go back to the framework that my colleague uh, showed with all of the little boxes which are inter interconnected, it's quite possible that for one system, only this box, for example, will be done by an AI and the rest is actually uh, made, the decision is made and the inputs are given by humans. It's also possible that uh, for the uh, most dreaded, like the fully autonomous killer robot things, that everything is being done by the system. Then all of these different boxes, you have to prove that the system can actually fulfill all, all of these different legal tests. But it, it depends. So it, if, if only one box will be, uh, the decisions will be made by an AI, then you have to prove that this box actually does fulfill the IHL requirements. For the accountability thing, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for that, even though I love the topic. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you guys for your talk. Let's give them a round of applause. And we can move on to our next talk. The paper is titled Supporting the Reasoning About Environmental Consequences of, of Institutional Actions. The authors are Rafael Kunha, Jumi Hubner, and Michael De Brito. Rafael will be presenting, so over to you. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, I will start. Uh, hi, hi everyone. I will present the work called Supporting the Reason About Environmental Consequence of Institutional Action. My name is Rafael Cunha. This work is also authored by professors Jomi Hubner and Michael De Brito. We are from Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. To understand this work, consider a scenario where an agent called S. Bob has the goal of conquering a new territory. S. Bob knows from some available guidelines that its goal is achieved by performing a digital action. For example, sending a message posted on a web service that has the status or count as common an attack. This action is supposed to produce in the environment the facts correspond to such status. For example, territory conquered, buildings destroyed, killed opponents, etc. In other words, the digital action that counts as common and attack brings the world to a new state where as Bob achieves its goal. However, the facts of having achieved the goal may not be explicit to the agent. It can choose the action to perform based solely on its status. Inspired by human societies, some works propose models and tools to manage the assignment of statuses to the elements involved in the multi-agent system, or simply mass. The, these works usually consider that some concrete facts occur in the environment constitute or count as institutional facts. It is represented by the line called constitution in the left. These institutional facts are composed of constituted status functions. Status functions are status that assign functions to elements in the system. These functions cannot be explained through their physical virtues. For example, the status buyer assigns to an agent some functions, such as performing a payments, take loans, etc. Artificial institutions are the mass component responsible for defining the conditions for assigning functions to concrete elements. For example, agents may have the stars of soldiers, while some of their digital actions may have the stars of command and attack. Works involving artificial institutions focus on assigning stars to elements that compose the mass in a process called constitution. However, as far as you know, the works don't address the facts in the environment of such statuses. For example, a digital action if they assign the stars of command and attack can trigger a series of consequences in the environment, such as 
killing a soldier from a late base, killing innocent people. However, these consequences may be undesired by the agents. These consequences came from the status and not from the actions itself. The agents may not even predict them then if it doesn't know the details about the status assigned to the executed action. In short, this problem involves the relation that exists between the constitution of status functions and their consequences in the environment. Philosopher John Cirlo addresses it under the notion of purpose. The essential elements of the proposed model are agents, here, states, institution, and purposes. Agents pursue their goals in the system. In this work, goals are something that agents aim to achieve, for example, the holding of a certain state. Anti-goal is an undesired circumstance of the system. In this work, anti-goals represent states or that the agent doesn't wish to reach for some reason. Agents can perform actions that trigger events in the mass here. Institutions provide the social interpretation of the environmental elements of the system about purpose. The functions associated with status functions can satisfy the practical interests of agents. From the institution's perspective, these interests are called purposes. From the agent's perspective, these interests are their goals or anti-goals. Then we claim that the goals or anti-goals of the agents met with the purposes of the status functions and goals, anti-goals, and the purposes points to the environmental states related to the status functions. From these elements, the agents can reason about the environmental effects of actions executed in institutional contexts. These effects may include those desired by the agents in the case of the agent's goals and those undesired in the case of the agents and goals. In the following, we present two algorithms that describe such reason. The first algorithm finds what were the facts on the environment of an action that has a status. The first step, the algorithm verifies whether the action is an institutional action. That is, if the event E constitutes something in the institution, in line five. If true, good, go to the next step. Otherwise, it returns the empty set in line 12. In the second step, the algorithm ranges over every status function constituted by the action E. The third step to, goes through all the purposes related to the status functions found. Finally, in the fourth step, the states associated to every status functions constituted by the action E are added to the set S. There is the algorithm returns in the line 12. The second algorithm checks if the actions can produce an state considered and go by the agent. If it exists, returns true in line four. Ah, okay. To describe the institutional specification used in the example of this work, we use an ontology. This ontology relates individuals who represent status functions to individuals who represent purposes. For example, the status functions command and attack is related to individual new territory. This ontology also relates individuals that represent the purposes with individuals that represent the states of the world that can be reached from the constitution of status functions. For example, the purpose new territory is related to the territory conquered, killed a soldier from a light base and killed innocent people. We implement these algorithms using the example of this paper in a practical way using Jacobin framework 
implementation of the situated artificial institution model, or simply SI and MES ontology. SI provides means to spe specify status functions and constitu constitutive rules and to manage the constitution process. MES ontology is a Cartago artifact that allows persistent information in ontologies. Given the institutional specification in the last slide, the agents can conclude what what, uh, what are the consequences of the actions it performs, and more than that, it can differentiate between desired and undesired consequences. With the proposed model, agents can access and reason about the consequences of institutional ac actions and get adapted to different scenarios. They can note that some purposes point to states that are similar to their interests, and therefore useful to reach their goals or avoid these purposes because they point to states that are similar to their anti-goals. In both cases, the agent has more information while deciding whether a particular action will help it or no. As future work, we plan to explore additional theoretical aspects related to the proposal, such as investigations about how other proposed institutional abstractions, for example, social functions, fit on the model and check if the purposes related to status must be further detailed. We plan to also address more practical points, such as integrate this model into other computational models that implement the constitution of status functions and evaluate the application of the model in scenarios that involve ethical reason of agents. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank the presenter. Are there any questions? So I did have one question. I was wondering in terms of, is this working at, let's say the first level? So, so it's, it's like the direct concept count as, so this action counts as the initiation of some some other action. So I'm wondering if, if it considers like a further level where this action counts as the initiation of, initiation of another action, but then that action initiates some other thing which results in the problem scenario. Like, does it consider more than one level? Am I making sense? Yeah, may, may, I, may I try to, to answer? We, we discussed yeah. this a lot, so it's a very good question. Okay. <laughs> Because the, the, the problem you are you are facing is how to, to manage to, to explicitly specify in the institution the consequences of some actions that are institutional. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these consequences, some of them are direct, as, as you mentioned, the first level consequences. But there are there are also some second, third, and, and more. Uh, consequences that are that come later after the, the first action. And uh, for us at, at this moment in this uh, project, we are not dealing with uh, this, uh, this issue. We are uh, giving this problem for the designer. So he is uh, in, in the charge to, to list all the consequences they, they think are relevant for, for the problem. Okay. If these consequences are, are, are in the first level, third, or, or, or in the long future, we are, we are not uh, uh, considering by, by now. Okay. By now, we are supposing that the designer is, is able to specify in the institution all the future consequences of the, the institutional action. So, so agents are able to, to read that specification and take a proper decision regarding his own values and beliefs and, and so on. Okay. So I, I hope I have answered your, your yeah. question. Yes, you have, thank you. Okay, is there any other question from the floor? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. And we'll go on to the fourth paper. The title is Fleur, Social Values Orientation for Robust Norm Emergence. Uh, Christine Zeng, Nirav Ajmari, and Munindar Singh. Uh, I think we were missing one paper. We, we should be going to third. Oh, my apologies. 
Yes. Actually, so, I was about to say that uh, yes, right. you skipped the third paper. I I, I apologize. Sorry about right. that. Epistemic diversity and explanatory adequacy in distributed information processes. Apologies again. Right. This paper is by Asimina Mertzani, um, Jeremy Pitt, Andreas Nowak, and Thomas McCulloch. Exactly. Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see. Go ahead. So, good evening. I would like to, uh, I, uh, good evening, morning, afternoon, I don't know, it really has to do with the time zone. I am Asimina Marjani, and I'm a PhD student at the Imperial College of London. Uh, today I will present you our research on epistemic diversity and explanatory adequacy in distributed information processing. So I would like to start this presentation uh, with Plato's allegory of cave. So this is a concept that describes how humans perceive reality and whether there is any higher truth to existence. In the allegory, there is a group of people who have lived their life chained behind the wall, which can be considered the prisoners, and they try to derive the truth nature of an object based on the shadow it casts on the wall. The shadows are actually the prisoner's reality uh, that they try to perceive through their senses and are not accurate representations of the real world. The objects under the sun or under the fire, as you can see in the image, can be true objects or can be puppets. Uh, according to Plato, the aim of a philosopher is to reason the shadows that they see in order to understand and perceive the higher levels of reality. You, you might be curious why did I start this presentation this way, but this is because it can actually be an abstract form of a problem of explanatory adequacy, where there's a group of autonomous agents connected by a network, uh, which is trying to explain the observation of a value by mapping a set of individual explanations into a single collective output. In contrast with previous work that we were considering that the, the group should uh, try to pull its diverse opinions to produce a social choice. In this case, uh, the group is actually trying to pull its diverse knowledge to produce a plausible explanation. Uh, such a problem can be encountered in social systems such as jury trials but can also be encountered in cyber physical uh, systems such as sensor networks. If we would like to make a one-to-one -one mapping from Plato's allegory of cave to the problem of explanatory adequacy, we would see that the prisoners are the group of autonomous agents. The object behind the wall is the rules that cause an observation. The shadows are the signal value that the agents can sense, while the aim of the agents is to derive the explanation, so to derive the rules that produce an observation, which observation is a signal value that the agents can sense. To solve this kind of meta problem faced by the group, we use a psychological theory called regulatory theory of social influence for two main reasons. The first is that it suggests that social influence is bilateral, meaning that as well as there are sources that seek for targets to influence, there are also targets who seek for sources by whom to be influenced because they want to gather information or they want to gather explanations for a certain phenomenon. So the second uh, important thing of this that this theory suggests uh, and was very useful for our case was that in addition to the to exchanging of opinions, people also can exchange information processing rules. Uh, based on this psychological theory, we developed an algorithm and we used the following specification. So there is a group of network autonomous agents, we can, uh, which can be called the distributed information processing unit. And they are embedded in an environment in which there is a process P uh, parameterized by a set of processing rules which can be called K, and this process converts a set of inputs into an output. 
uh, the processing rules in K can be considered, can be perceived as the ground truth knowledge in this environment, and each agent um, of the group uh, can know a subset of the rules in K. So um, uh, an agent's knowledge is KA. The problem faced by the agent is that they try to use their partial knowledge to explain the solution to the process P. So to find out which are the processing rules that cause the observation that they make. And the method to do is, is by aggregating their distributed knowledge into a single collective output using the algorithm based on the regulatory theory of social impact. Uh, however, as happened also in Plato's case, this is an iterative and dynamic process, so it cannot only be done once. Uh, the, network, uh, the network of the agents can be dynamic, so agents might join, agents can leave, and also knowledge is dynamic, so new agents might bring new knowledge to the network and therefore the agent and the knowledge change over time. Also, agents have several ways to produce their explanation. So they can ask a neighboring agent for an explanation. They can receive feedback from the environment for the quality of the collective and individual explanation. And they can also discover the new knowledge by asking the new agents being added in the dynamic network. And another important thing is to note is that since then uh, this process is iterative and uh, it's dynamic. Therefore, also the expertise is temporal. Uh, and it can occur that a group of uh, people that can, or of agents that can produce the most accurate explanation on a certain period of time might leave the network, or it might occur that new agents join the population and they introduce new knowledge. Therefore, the group of experts uh, of a previous uh, period cannot really produce a more accurate, accurate presentation in the present, so they are not considered anymore the experts of the group. Uh, the overall aim of this research and of the experiments was to investigate what initial conditions on the deep uh, produce what, diff uh, what type of epistemic condition and how adequately does the epistemic condition explain the ground truth knowledge? And therefore, we experimented on different conditions uh, affecting the rate of change of population, the rate of change of knowledge, and, the, and we experimented on two ways of communicating processing rules with the social network. I will not delve into the experimental details, but you can find them in the paper. And now we'll move um, to, the ex uh, to introduce briefly the experimental result, results. So we ran three series of experiments in static and dynamic populations, in dynamic populations in which knowledge became available progressively and knowledge was not persistent, meaning that new agents could only bring new knowledge to the population, but they didn't uh, but in order to have access to past knowledge, they should ask existing agents. And uh, we also run experiments on dynamic populations in which knowledge could be progressively discovered and knowledge was persistent. Um, there, uh, we illustrated the simulation results in the following graphs, the, the, the ones that you can see in the figure, and the observation that we made, uh, the observations that we made for the different cases were the following. So static population seems to seem to be stable, but our uh, knowledge is stagnant. Dynamic populations manage to maintain diversity, but cannot produce ex uh, um, plausible explanation in short in long term and become incongruent. Uh, in cases that populate that agents were almost identical in terms of knowledge, knowledge remained stagnant and they could not improve uh, their explanatory adequacy. And in cases that agents were incapable of understanding the diversity of knowledge sources, uh, they remained narrow 
thank you, narrow no list because they actually didn't ask each other even if there were different sources of knowledge. And the last experiments that they could quickly and slowly discover, get access to new knowledge, discover new knowledge, we observed that in both cases, they managed to maintain epistemic diversity, but actually only in the second case, they had time to assimilate the new knowledge and, develop, and improve their explanatory adequacy. So overall, this I want to highlight that this research doesn't try to claim that for these initial conditions, you will get this epistemic condition and uh, uh, this ability in terms of explanatory adequacy. But what we want to, uh, to claim is that different conditions in the population produce different epistemic conditions. And these different epistemic conditions produce different quality in terms of explanatory adequacy. So um, these kind of systems are more like cybernetic systems in which the ending condition is not predetermined by the starting conditions, but it has to do with what happens in the system. And now we'll conclude this presentation uh, saying that in complex cyber-physical systems, it seems unavoidable to encounter a problem such that of Plato's cave, where there's a group of people, agents, sensors, whatever, that is trying to understand, to explain a value that they observe. Um, so what is important is to understand how social influence works and use it as a mechanism to avoid ending up in a situation in which the agents or the people is being like the prisoners who believe what they're told, but they should be more, try, uh, they should try to be more like the philosopher who is performing reasoning to explain the reality behind the shadow, behind the observation. And I think that concludes my presentation. And I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm open for questions. So. Thank you for your presentation, Samina. Oh. Again, apologies for skipping you earlier. It's all right, don't worry. Time has passed and um, like we are really on that meeting hours, so it makes sense, don't worry. All right, are there any questions? Okay, so again, I had one question. Amazing. So I noticed that there seems to be an assumption that, that all the agents are happy to share the, the knowledge that they have and that they are also very honest agents in terms of like they don't hide any information and they provide the truth. Now, if we were to remove that assumption, what would, have you thought about what effect it will have on, on, your, on your model? Yeah, actually, that's a very important uh, note. And thank you for making that question, because that's what we ended up like uh, when we did this research we we thought that in the future it would be very interesting to consider to to consider cases that agents let's say have rationalities or have incentives for not sharing this knowledge yeah. or they are not considering that there is a, that, that the process that the that in order the, that it's important to participate in making uh, in saying they're in making an explanation so yeah. uh, we are not really sure what will happen if we have these cases of uh, agents with uh, mixed incentives or um, cases that uh, they just don't want to participate they are ignorant they are not interested in that so uh, I think in future work it's a very nice um, a comment that we it would be very interesting to see what happens in such cases. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. We can thank you too. <laughs> we can we can now move on to the next paper. Thanks. So Christine, yes. go ahead. Uh, so this is orientation for robust norm emergence. Christine Zhang, Nirav Ajmeri, and Munidar Singh. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Christine. 
and I'm I'm going to present our work for social value orientation and robust norm emergence. So social value orientation defines a person's preference for research for resource allocation between self and others. In terms of computation, social value orientation revised the construction of an agent's utility function by putting different weight on itself and others. Let's start from a scenario from the ongoing pandemic. Many local authorities announced a mask mandate, mandate, and most people know that wearing a mask helps to protect themselves and others. We know that when agent interaction is inevitable, one agent's behavior can, uh, may influence others. If someone tests positive for a pandemic and that person is a prosocial or altruistic person, he might choose to put the mask on when interacting with a healthy person. However, if he is a prosocial, if he is a pro self, uh, no, if he is an individual list person, he might just choose to follow his personal preference. <clears throat> In this work, we investigate how social value orientation influences non compliance and our contribution includes incorporating subjective weight from social value orientation into decision-making process. Our agent architecture includes four main components. They are cognitive model, world model, social model, and the decision model. The cognitive model includes BDI architecture and preference. In psychology, Preference are the attitude towards a set of object. In other words, they provide intrinsic reward. The world model describes the context where the agents are and represent the world's um, general knowledge. The social model includes social values, normative reasonings, and non-fulfillment. In this work, social value orientation provides agents with different preference over resource allocation between themselves and others. And this figure shows the social value orientation ring and the reward angle. The reward function of, a, of agent I could be represented as this equation. The R of I is the reward of agent I and the R of negative I is the main reward of all other agents in interacting with agent I. And here, data rep uh, represents the social value orientation type of agent. In our evaluation, we simulate a pandemic scenario with, uh, with a mask mandate. Agents decide whether to wear a mask when interacting with one another at each round and the agent decide whether to sanction others based on the collective behaviors. So if, if I choose to wear a mask and I see someone else didn't wear a mask, I may choose to sanction the others. And in our simulation, we define agent societies with different distributions of social value orientation. We have, we consider altruistic, prosocial, selfish and competitive agent societies. And the mixed societies includes the equal distribution of all those four types of um, social value orientation. Our metrics includes compliance, social experience, and the percentage of agents who didn't met, uh, who doesn't meet their preference. We hypothesize that the preference for other reward would positively affect non-compliance and social experience, but negatively affect the tendency to meet their preference. And in our results, the altruistic agent and prosocial agent has the best compliance and the Selfish and competitive agent in the mixed society decrease the compliance in that mixed society. <clears throat> the social experience shows the similar trend. The 
selfish and competitive agent in the mixed society decreases the general health in the mixed society. And in the percentage that, in the result, we can, show, uh, we can see that the prosocial and the altruistic agent societies has more, more um, percentage of agents who didn't meet their preference because they choose to sacrifice their own preference. In our conclusions, um, the floor architecture incorporating the social value orientation into the decision making process. And our conclusion is that the altruistic agent and the pro social agent has better compliance for the pro social mass mandate. And those um, interactions leads to higher social experience, but less percentage of agents to meet their preference. According to the result, we think that the policymaker may define may, uh, may have to define appropriate sanctions to motivate those competitive and selfish agents to follow the social norms. Our future directions include that in investigate the effect of unequal, di unequal distribution of social value orientation. And we also consider to incorporate human values into the aging architecture. The other direction is to reveal the adequate informa information to persuade others to, for the inevitable non-violation. Thank you. Thank you. So are there any questions? Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, yeah th thank you for the presentation, Christine. The, the question I had was, um, you know, you have done a simulation, you have simulated uh, various scenarios with different types of agents. So I did wonder whether you have had a chance to look at real life data from different communities to see to what extent your results conform to the real life data. You know, is, is there um, convergence or divergence? And if there is divergence, why is that the case? And, you know, what can we learn from all of this? No, actually uh, our simulation was not based on real data. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. I, yeah. I, I was thinking whether whether there is some correspondence to what you found in simulation to what what people may have done in 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 real life. So I'm just I'm just saying this could also be your future work to look at you know, what has really happened. So that's that's all I'm suggesting here. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Go ahead, Rene. Um, yeah, a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I may have missed it, but um, what kind of things did an agent use when sanctioning? And could you also get agents that were like hypercritical, like they would not wear the masks themselves, but they would sanction others for not wearing masks? Because I can imagine if you're very selfish, you don't want to get sick. So you can get mad at other people not wearing masks, but you also don't want to wear a mask yourself. So that, that, that to me, that sort of feels intuitive as a a kind of behavior that you would want to, that you could see. But um, in our simulation right now, only consider that if the agent, um, only when the agent is self wear the mask and see others doesn't wear a mask, that's the only case the okay. agent will sanction the other. Okay. All right, thanks. So I had a quick one. So I was wondering, um, do the social value orientations of the agents change throughout the simulation or they remain, will it be altruistic or, sorry, I don't remember all the words you use, but like, so do they remain that way and always act that particular way throughout the simulation or they, those things can change depending on the circumstances? 
it will just remain stable during the simulation because we consider social variable orientation as a stable preference. Ah, there you go. All right, thank you. All right, thank you guys. We are moving on to the fifth paper. I think I'm correct with that one. Computational discovery of transaction-based financial crime by grammatical evolution, the case of Ponzi schemes. Peter Fratrick, Giovanni Sileno, Tom Van Engers, and Sander Klaus. And I apologize if I said any name incorrectly. Oh, actually, it was said pretty, pretty well. Uh, maybe Great. my name is it's just with, with uh, Fratrick. Uh, that's a small detail. Okay, okay so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my, my name is Peter Fratrick, and I will be, I'm, I'm going to show the early storage. Uh, research on computational discovery of transaction-based financial crime uh, via grammatical evolution. Uh, so transaction monitoring is inherent and increasingly important part of any economic systems as, as all of transaction systems are becoming the digital. And, but, but the issue is that both in symbolic and sub-symbolic detection systems meet their limitations in, in this task. Uh, and, in particular, the rule-based systems, there's this problem that we don't really have enough rules to, to kind of de describe well the, the individual cases of, of, of crime. And we, we don't really know well how to learn new ones from observed data. Uh, so that's also like a challenging uh, area. And the machine learning um, approach is not doing all that well because we usually have not enough data and not enough data in the sense that it is unbalanced data, uh, which means that they have only a small number of instances of, of fraudulent observation and a lot of uh, non-fraudulent ones. And, and there you kind of collapse also anomality and abnormality into one thing. So very often it's just statistics based. And of course, that there is other nature of non-compliance and uh, that each time you detect something, the the adversary will come up with a smarter way. So, and there are some ways how to go about it, and with some novel methods, but there are still kind of a lot of limitations. Um, but we kind of can start from like three observations, and this this paper really argued that you can have like agent-based models to generate synthetic data, and generate the, not the fraudulent behavior in the in the simulation environment. And what this diagram shows, it kind of formalizes this idea that that you can define some search space of, of fraudulent behavior that is some abstract representation. Then you define an algorithm to search, search the search space. And then you have some simulated environment in which you can execute the, the fraud, uh, which will define the fitness of, a, of the fraudulent scheme. And you can kind of uh, like make this like a uh, human AI hybrid system of of, uh, of, of the uh, of, of the, the the employees of some tax agency and they can they can like design this agent based model and they can extend it and maybe extend the observables and and so on and so on. Um, so that's like the basic idea of uh, that is really trying to focus on, on the fact that very often the violations of the law exploit some legislative or psychological vulnerabilities, and you can maybe perhaps model it in the simulated environment. Um, and this, of course, comes as a big, like some some issues, if in a hypothetically are kind of solved, and especially the generation of synthetic data. Um, but also you can, you can even possibly discover instances of non-compliance that are that were not absorbed in the in the real world, uh, which means you, you would even mitigate the problem of the adversarial nature of the system. And but of course there are these challenges that simulated environments can be very difficult to design and needs to be also extendable. Uh, so that's like a design software development challenge. And it the most important thing that it requires kind of sophisticated models of reasoning for the non-compliant agent. Are a lot of computing power, so that's the issue with the with the schemes. They are they can be very complex, so you need very smart agents uh, to model that. And what what we can kind of came up with as a as a case study is a case of Ponzi schemes. 
And so, so you can you can start with illustrating this methodology on the on the uh, simple case of this problem scheme. Because the thing about Ponzi schemes is that they are not just one type, but there is like actually a lot of types of how you how you redistribute the capital. And and if you kind of go into these papers, some of them are even observing that you can even kind of conceptualize that this particular psychological vulnerability of people that they are kind of greedy and naive in some ways they are exploited by how these Ponzi schemes are designed in a, in a way how they, re, they redistribute the capital uh, what, what was very nice paper to start this study on is the, the one from Bartoli in 2020 uh, which can categorize these schemes by by going through a blockchain uh, Ethereum and um, because there you have smart contracts and and they are, they are basically pieces of code that are implementing the Ponzi scheme. So these are the fraudulent cases, and it's like of course a problem with with blockchain that you, you you sort of need to detect, read the code and detect which kind of smart contract is fraudulent or not. So that was like a nice a nice nice starting point. Uh, so how it basically works is that you have a couple of agents and, and you have some trustworthiness functions defined and if, if one agent finds the contract to be trustworthy, they will send money there, which means that they uh, in, get into the contractual relationship. Uh, so so you kind of design the grammar and, and the, which are so, some of these if else, uh, if, if premise and actions pairs and as you as, and you can search the grammar space through evolution algorithm uh, so which you, you will ex, uh, get some sequences of actions for the smart contract to execute so like we're kind of modeling the smart contracts code with some easier language um, and what what we actually got uh, from there is that you, you can uh, you can obtain this kind of transaction graphs so so that each and so in the upper case we have like a waterfall scheme that's a repayment mechanism where you send money like every every time you receive a new payment and then you have like a more sophisticated scheme which has actually like a memory so it's uh it it, it remembers which to, to whom the money was sent last and then they send uh to somebody else that is in the in the in the array to, to be repaid and they have different like fitness in how much people they can interact based on our assumptions. Um, yeah, so this this work is kind of in the in the in the beginning, but of course the thing that you need to that there are a lot of challenges, and I would say the main one is really the uh, design of the architecture of of the non-compliant agent because you need uh, it, it kind of requires planning and and the um, cooperation possibly and um very often you don't optimize for a short-term reward but you are optimizing for a long-term reward so even with reinforcement learning this can be a difficult task and of course you want like white box models and that's even more difficult because then you, you will need to kind of go into these more old-fashioned types of ai um so yeah these are the challenges and uh and that's something to think about. And with, with that, I would kind of conclude the presentation. And uh, thank you for your attention. Um, then maybe there's just a small appendix if somebody is interested how the final results look like uh, in in the cut. Yep. Uh, but that's that's all from from me. Thank you. Thank you. I see Julian. Go ahead. Yeah, I I thank you, Peter. Uh, I wanted to ask you if in your grammar you have any type of uh, recursion or transitivity or something like that. Yeah, the, the grammar is recursive uh, because it, it was that you, you need more than one action. I mean, as I was kind of showing very briefly uh, the sequences. Uh, so that, there are these kind of typical sequences like add new agent into the to the contract or add new transaction and send money uh, so so you can have like multiple actions in in the in, in the sequence that you execute basically at each time step which requires the recursive grammar because you don't really know how many actions you need 
Uh, but the, the grammar is, of course, limited to some maximum length. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is how you uh, ensure termination by, by the length. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there no, any other questions? Great. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. I will go on to the last paper of the session. Uh, reasoning about collective action in Markov logic, a case from ancient Athens. Trishala, Srivatsan, Stephen Greenfield, and Jeremy Pitt. Again, apologies. Yeah, go ahead when you're ready. You're muted, Ashel. Ashel, you're muted. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about reasoning about collective action in Markov logic, a case study from classical events. So our aim, motivating people to work together for the common good is a significant social goal. It is an opportunity for computational agents to assist people with social reasoning. Here we consider how explicit reasoning about common knowledge informs decisions to act in the common good and the use of punishment to sustain these decisions. So common knowledge means it's a knowledge known by everyone or nearly everyone in the group. Let's say I know something and you know the same thing cannot be common knowledge. I know something and I know that you know the same thing. You know that I know the same thing and so on. That is common knowledge. In practice, there are various ways of achieving this common knowledge. So we will discuss in our later slides. So we found a specific trial belongs to classical events to model this concept. This trial represents the importance of cooperation in terms of common knowledge. We model this trial using Markov logic network. So Markov logic network is a probabilistic undirected graphical model. It allows logical clauses to be weighted to have probabilistic reasoning, uncertainty. It allows queries of conditional probabilities on ground formulas. So the trial is all about a classical Athenian, uh, Leocrates, who was alleged that who abandoned the city when it was in a crisis. So the trial was prosecuted by a famous Athenian um, politician, Lycurgus, uh, with an intention of convincing the jurors to make him punished to ensure the security of the country. So during the prosecution, he, talk, he talked about two equilibria. First one is security of Athens is a common pool resource. So contribution of each citizen is compulsory. The second one is whoever violates the first one um, should be sanctioned or punished. So actually, Lycurgus was convincing the jurors how this conviction maintained this equilibria. So now the jury member listening to all these arguments and he is in the situation to make a decision based on um, uh, Leocrates, uh, whether to punish or not. He wants to know how people will cooperate based on his decision. So do remember is considering a prototypical citizen called Politus to see how his decision will impact her cooperation. So now do remember things what Politus may think about others. So based on the prosecution arguments, do remember is observing some aspects regarding Politus. First one is group goal. Politus is aware about there is a group goal in Athens that is securing the city. And Politus is no, Politus is aware this group goal is common knowledge. Everybody knows there is a common knowledge and everybody knows that everybody knows it and so on. So this common knowledge comes from the alignment cascade. During the crisis, people, will follow others to rebuild the country by obeying some decrees. Second one is observation of attitudes to cooperation. So Politus is aware about two important ethoses based on this group goal. First one is unconditional one. People will cooperate if there is a common knowledge about the group goal. Second one is conditional. 
people will cooperate when courts convict traitors. Third one is proportion of ethos. So politics can estimate the proportion of cooperation among the people. So in our model, we consider there is 60% of cooperation among the people. Out of that, 20% comes from ethos one and 80% comes from ethos two. That is the conditional one uh, when court convicting traitors. So this proportion of cooperation also common knowledge. People talk to each other about past trial and the present uh, results of the trial. So that is also uh, common knowledge. So based on all of these arguments, do remember can create the first order logic clauses that is MLN clauses. This is how it looks like. So uh, this is what we have created, the MLN formulas based on the Likagas arguments. So this MLN, MLN formulas will create the Markov network, the undirected graphical model. Now the jury member can send a query to ask, what is the probability of politics cooperate uh, to securing the city on both condition, when Leocrates is convicted and not convicted. So based on the model, we have received uh, probability one, that is the high value, Politus will cooperate when he is convicted, but 0.12 when he is not. So if you see, there's a large gap between these two numbers. So the jury member can guess in advance what will happen before make his, making his decision. So if you see, every closest, every close in this MLN will represent the common knowledge, the notion of common knowledge. So the conclusion itself common knowledge. So the jury member can come to the conclusion, other jury member will also take the similar decision based on the common knowledge among them. Conclusion. So this trial is addressing rich arguments of reasoning about common knowledge in order to achieve common good. So we demonstrated how MLN can be used to model this trial. So if you consider this uh, right-hand side, this is our current work. This is what we have done. But in our future work, we are going to consider the left-hand side. Actually, in our current work, uh, we have encoded what common knowledge is. But in our future work, we are going to simulate and see how this common knowledge can emerge from the social level uh, out of uh, Likaga's arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Pablo, go ahead. I, I, I may have missed a fundamental comment, but I wasn't sure why you needed Markov logic. Couldn't you do any other form of reasoning? What is specific about common knowledge that needs to be reflected in the Markov logic? Uh, actually, we specifically choose Markov logic because some certain facts we can do with. Uh, first one is the uncertainty, but even say there are several um, um, network like Bayesian networks and everything. But specifically, we choose Markov no logic network. Uh, we can use weighted clauses, weighted clauses, uh, weighted MLN clauses, as well as uh, kinds. Uh, things like ethos, uh, the proportion of ethos, we can simply uh, encode with Markov logic network. And also we can query uh, conditional probabilities. So that is the reason we have chosen Markov logic network. Did you have any alternatives that you explored? Could you have considered other forms of addressing those issues? Uh, so far, we haven't considered, but previously we, uh, we, we thought of considering the Bayesian network, but finally we came to uh, this decision because we cannot uh, uh, include the weighted clauses, but that is the feature of um, Markov logic network. And the other one is uh, undirected graphical model. Okay. So that is also one feature. So that is uh, the reason, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. So um, this is Munender. Um, about your 
So you don't mention a whole lot of norms in all of this. I think you maybe wrap them into the um, uh, into the ethos, perhaps. But uh, a lot of the time, these constructs such as common knowledge, which are you know, as you mentioned, unboundedly nested beliefs, they are practically unachievable through finite communications. So they are there. The common knowledge is there only if it's there already. Like so, it's it's, it's there if it's the if it's an invariant. You don't get common knowledge out of, you know, if there is no common knowledge, you don't get it by communicating. So I wonder why, why, why not just talk about it in normative terms and, you know, leave, leave the, you know, not worry about the common knowledge part of it. Um, actually, spe specifically this work, we focused on common knowledge. Uh, but as you said, that is a uh, nested terms, but uh, in practice, uh, it, it's a small work. Uh, like I said, uh, the right-hand side, uh, we have encoded actually what common knowledge is and the ways that uh, we have achieved, the, the various ways of achieving. Uh, because uh, as I say, mentioned earlier, this is not, uh, it is really hard to achieve common knowledge in a nested form in practice. Uh, but uh, there are literatures uh, mentioning how this common knowledge can achieved uh, in various ways. That's what I mentioned in my slides. Maybe in our future work, we will uh, think about that and we will simulate and see how uh, this can be achieved. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there, there's a you know, common knowledge has been studied a while. It was a prominent thing, maybe uh, even 25, 30 years ago. The mm -hmm. general idea is that many many important problems could be solved if you had common knowledge. So there's a you know, yes. but but then the converse side, you know, how do you get common knowledge is not always is, is not clear. And I think you seem to be recognizing it. You're saying it's common knowledge because you type you know you wrote it up right. You actually literally wrote the you typed it up so you, you can claim it's common knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a conceptually less burdensome approach would be to uh, think about the norms directly and not uh, be be beholden to uh, these kinds of a more complex representation. And if, if I can just jump in quickly, that the book by um, Ober about classical Athens is actually all about slight simplification, but it's very much about how Athens um, introduced mechanisms for citizens to achieve common knowledge. So by having public monuments declaring things and, and having festivals mm -hmm. where people had to sort of go past these monuments, building all their sort of public forums so that everyone could see everyone else was observing the same thing. So I think in practice, um, you know, you can't logically reason and get this infinite regress of I know that you know that I know, um, but you can realize that everyone else is attending to the same thing at the same time and, and people can, you know, understand that as common knowledge and there are actually psychological papers um, about that. Right. I, think the, I think the latter is, is, is probably what, what actually goes about and I think, so there's the notion of common knowledge, which is an informal understanding, which you said, maybe everybody's at, you know, the common ground maybe is what you're thinking of. Uh, and then there's the logician sort of construction of it with these infinite regress. And I think those are different concepts. So if you use, if you, if you decide to follow the logician's version of it, you know, you're paying the price for uh, capabilities you don't really need because all you need is, is the more, right. the, the simpler one. We, we actually like the Lewis Lewis's theory of common knowledge, which says that you have these things called reflexive common indicators and given certain mm -hmm. properties, then you can sort of perceive um, that some signals represent facts that are common knowledge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it bypasses that whole infinite regress. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think the logical analysis could also make that a first, uh, first level construct as opposed to trying to, you know, you, you know so you don't need to define those uh, uh, th those bubbles containing more bubbles, right, with the, the people. Yeah, the bubbles are just a way of illustrating, um, you know, that's not achievable by a single communicative act, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's some, something goes on psychologically that means we understand that is in place, but not, not in that infinitely nested form. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Could you guys join me in congratulating all the presenters from this session? Thank you. All right. So thank you to each and every one of the presenters and the authors of, of the papers in this session. And I'm going to hand you over to Narav and he's going to give the closing remarks. 
How about you there? So Nita, you're muted. Yeah, I, I know, like I was try, trying to find, I, when I shared, I, I was trying to find where, where the unmute button was like, a, uh, so, sorry about that. Yes, uh, so yes, uh, just, just extending thanks uh, to not just uh, the speakers of this session, but to everybody uh, who presented, including uh, the research paper presentation presenters and our keynote speakers is very good. Uh, uh, and also like, I would like to thank everybody who participated, stayed, stayed with us for four, like almost five hours now. With, with only short breaks. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, some of you had to wake up too soon and some of you had to stay up till late. Uh, we also like to thank the reviewers uh, who gave us the comments. Uh, just, I don't want to make it long, uh, but this, uh, so a uh, few, few things. Uh, everybody who presented today, they would be invited for the post proceedings. Mm, the criteria for acceptance would be like, uh, you should be looking at going back to the reviews that you received and try to address those comments that you received in the reviews. And we would like you to submit any, an additional response document when you submit for the post proceedings. Uh, we, we did notice that a lot of you uh, revised your paper when we asked for the camera ready, like uh, the preprint camera ready. So um, I we just want you all to reflect back on any feedback that you received today. We, if you, if the, you can make the notes today, th those are still fresh with you. Uh, what we would be doing is like, we'll share this revised document with one of the reviewer who originally reviewed your paper. And so we, we want to have a quick turnaround time. So we, uh, and what we were trying to, we are hoping is like give each reviewer one, one paper. I think uh, in our previous conversation or message, we mentioned that you can extend your paper up to 18 pages, like to, so a total of 18 pages you can use up. And the deadline would be 31st May. Uh, I think Tony or one of us would, would send you all the details on how, how and where to submit the papers. Uh, I think uh, maybe Tony can clarify this, but like we, we did discuss among ourselves uh, that the, uh, the authors of short papers could make it long uh, and make it up to like make it a full page paper. Uh, maybe Tony can, like we have, I don't think we reached yes. a conclusion on that. Yes, I think, but then, but then we did discuss it and yes. that's an option that we will provide. But again, the deadline is going to be short. So if they're going to extend it, they can extend it um, you know, by that time. Is, is that right, Andresa? Did you recollect that, that discussion of ours? Yeah, I think we said that if they were interested in doing it, they, they yes. can within the same deadline. But if, if yes. not, they can leave it as a short paper. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I think I think short papers are twelve pages. Like, do, 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 maybe if they want to make it slightly longer, I think we would be okay with that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think they can they can ask us or let us know that you know they wanted um, slightly long you know um, slightly longer length so that that would be okay. Um, but but it's eighteen pages for full papers and twelve papers for short papers. Okay. because we already in increased the page length by two but if they wanted some additional papers they can always write to us um, uh, and then we can let springer know that um, they'll have some more pages sure. okay uh, i think we, we don't have much to say now but i think uh, just uh, that that was it uh, uh, we, uh, maybe for, uh, if said anybody has any comments or suggestions that uh, the next year's speaker uh, chairs could take into account we we welcome those comments you can set, give those comments now or we write to us and we, we can pass it on to whosoever is chairing the next year's coin 
Um, yeah, particularly, particularly if you had any comments on the conditional acceptance, because that's something new that we tried this time around. Instead of saying no for a paper, we wanted to give authors an opportunity to extend and, and be a part of, the part of the community. And along that process, they'll have an improved, improved paper. And also we had um, a suggestion again from our community that it'll be good if the short papers can be extended to long papers. Um, so um, so that, that suggestion again came from the community and we will see um, how many authors might take that up. But um, we realize the deadline is going to be quite tight. Okay. And yeah, I think it, uh, Frank alluded that next year's AMAS could be in London uh, yesterday at, at, I think, the simulation workshop. So if uh, next year it is in London, I'm hoping to see you 